Good morning. It is 9 o'clock. We're going to call today's Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Let me know for the record that there is a copy of the Open Meetings Act on the wall. There is a automatic defibrillator in the back of the room. And if you uh, will, please silence or turn off your phones. With that, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, With that, we will call to order the Douglas County Board of Equalization meeting. Roll call, please. Commissioner Borgeson? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Commissioner Duda? Present. Commissioner Kraft? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Item A is approval of the minutes of the Board of Equalization meeting held Tuesday, December 4th, 2018. Item B, call for a meeting and set Tuesday, December 18th, 2018 as the date for hearing on certified assessments and corrections. What's the will of the board? Move. Motion second. by Commissioner Kraft, second by Commissioner Morgan. Please vote. Uh, <clears throat> once again, Commissioner Boyle's vote will not be indicated on the screen, but he does vote yes, as do the rest of the commissioners. <clears throat> Motion passes. Item C is citizens' comments. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on board of equalization related items not listed on the agenda. Are there any citizens' comments at this time? I am here, Paul Bellinger, 10215 West Center Road. I would just like to have the uh, asking the Board of Equalization to receive the document into the record of today's meetings for my appeal for the suspension of disbelief of the others that caused my appeal. And that would be it. Would Thank you. It Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, um, we have. Uh, for resolutions, item D, E, F, and G. What's the will of the board? There's a motion by Commissioner Duda to approve D, E, F, G, and adjourn. Second by Commissioner Boyle. Please vote. Motion passes. All commissioners voting yes. We'll now call to order the Douglas County <coughs> Board of Corrections meeting. Roll call, please. Commissioner Borgeson? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Yes. Commissioner Duda? Yes. Commissioner Kraft? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes. Item one, uh, approval of the minutes of the Board of Corrections meeting held Tuesday, November 20th, 2018. What's the will of the board? The Motion by Commissioner Duda. Is there a second? Second, second by Commissioner Morgan. Please vote. passes all commissioners voting yes uh, item two is citizens comment this is an opportunity for citizens to comment on board of corrections related items not listed on the agenda are there any citizens comments seeing none item three is the report of the director of corrections director Myers <clears throat> good morning commissioners Mike Myers the uh, director of corrections for Douglas County um, I call your attention to my Board of Corrections report. Um, enclosure number one, um, we are over budget. Uh, that is mainly due to changes in uh, the FOP contract, which was enacted after our budget was approved. Um, we are getting close to coming up with the dollar amount uh, to work with uh, Mr. Lorenz on uh, for crediting our budget for the impact of that, um, of those contractual changes. Um, hopefully, we'll January or February's report will reflect um, an adjusted budget for here on out for the rest of the, uh, the fiscal year. In closure number two, community corrections and in-house programs. Um, 20 individuals were housed at our sanction center, uh, which is our utilization of the work release facility for individuals serving sanctions through probation and problem solving courts for 128 bed days. We've only been doing this since mid-July. Um, this was the highest number of people we've uh, referred over to, uh, to the Sanction Center uh, during that short history we have with that program. Um, a planning meeting was held for the Transitional Discharge Center with the county court judges in November. Uh, I actually just had the meeting with the district court judges for that program uh, last Friday. Um, and we actually did take our first placements into that program. That is another um, 
bed saving strategy initiative um, to try and shift individuals to the community correction center from the jail, individuals who we didn't take initially um, because of their overall history and risk, but we look at how they did during the course of their incarceration uh, and attempt to manage them in the work release center for the final week of their incarceration. In theory, we may be able to save, um, you know, well, we typically have about 30 individuals who have one week or less on a sentence left. Uh, I'm, some of those people are, are not over there for a good reason and they'll remain and serve their remaining days in the jail. But if we can get half of those people out um, to the work release center for their final week, uh, that'll have a, a, a measurable impact on our, uh, on our population in the jail. Um, our new pretrial release program continues to assess individuals who uh, are incarcerated after their initial um, court appearance and refers them for bond reviews. We've had some success with that. Uh, I will be revisiting with the planning group of stakeholders on that uh, to try and get a, ramp that up a little bit more in the in the coming months. Um, we also had uh, Operation Toy Lift, which is um, a very uh, it's an annual tradition. The Department of Corrections, a, a long partnership with the Salvation Army, uh, where they bring a group of people and we assist them with our staff, and they basically canvas the the population, the entire population of the jail to identify children of incarcerated parents, people who will be incarcerated on Christmas Day, um, and arrange for gifts to be uh, delivered to those families um, on behalf of their parent. So uh, a very worthwhile effort for us each year. And thanks to the Salvation Army for their partnership. The 24-7 sobriety program had 34 admissions. Uh, there were 3,020 breath tests that were completed. 14 uh, were positive for alcohol use. There were six no-shows. Uh, the overall compliance for breath testing was 99.4 percent. 41 individuals were monitored for a total of 780 days of scram monitoring. There were zero no-shows. There's one tampering violation and zero alcohol violations. Uh, the scram compliance rate was 99.9 percent. Um, there were 374 saliva drug tests administered with 19 positive tests, and there were 15 no-shows. There were eight dr drug testing patches submitted for testing with zero violations. Uh, work release uh, admitted 44 individuals in November. Uh, those individuals donated 198 hours of community service. House arrest admitted 60 individuals. RAP admitted 36 individuals. Uh, programs in the jail uh, admitted 50 individuals, and one individual there um, achieved a GED. 27 individuals were referred uh, for pre, uh, priority prosecution for pretrial services. Uh, 448 bed days were saved as a result. 563 individuals were placed on pretrial release during November, and in total, uh, 1,181 individuals over the course of the month were monitored on pretrial release with a 90% compliance rate. Um, first year data collection for the current audit cycle for community corrections is basically complete and just being organized at this point. We'll prepare for year two um, beginning in January. Uh, in closure number four, personnel. Um, we had a new hire class begin training last week. Uh, they will be uh, their graduation will take place in uh, early January and they'll be on the floors um, in mid-January. The class currently has 11 uh, candidates in it. Um, we'll be hiring another one or two classes right behind that one. Um, and then I hope to settle into more of a quarterly uh, training cycle uh, and new hire cycle after that. Uh, we hopefully will be where we need to be after those next couple of classes. Um, and Andrew Dunning um, was promoted from sergeant to lieutenant um, in November as well. So congratulations to Lieutenant Dunning. Uh, in closure number five, our population. Um, it has remained stubbornly high even as we got into the, the colder weather. Uh, we didn't really see um, any decline actually. Um, we had 600 and, what, excuse me, 1,650 admissions. We had 1,635 releases. Um, our high count was 1,346. Our low count was 1,228. Our average daily population was 1,301. 
Um, there were 367 uh, custodial sanctioned bed days. So we got about a third of those bed days served over in the sanction center, for, so we didn't have the full impact of those 367 days uh, in the jail. Um, the U.S. Marshal population decreased, um, the ICE population decreased, the felony pretrial population increased, the misdemeanor pretrial population decreased, and the female population increased, and we had four uh, housing units open for females uh, during November. Enclosure number six, our medical. Um, we had 1,356 uh, intake screenings. There were 472 health and physical assessments. Turning to enclosure number seven, mental health. We had 156 initial psychiatric assessments, 172 initial mental health assessments, there were 45 infirmary placements. We had five referrals to the Board of Mental Health and one referral to a long-term psychiatric facility. Um, other noteworthy items, we continued to conduct an organizational chart review of the Department of Corrections. Um, we are nearly complete. My final meeting for that process is uh, a little over a week from now on December 20th. Um, I'll get together with my leadership team at that point and we'll recommend any changes to how we want to organize and, and assign areas of responsibility based upon our current realities of the challenges that we face. Um, and then we will immediately start filling our vacant leadership positions at that point based upon that new organizational chart. Um, construction for the public safety bond continues in the first two housing units. Um, that's going fairly well. It is a little more complicated, I think, than the first phase of construction. Uh, there's a lot more digging in behind uh, through concrete walls and into floors, um, and that has created some occasional challenges, but they seem to be overcome in pretty short order, and the project remains on schedule. Um, I also wanted to point out um, the actions of, of Officer Alfredo Campos. Um, he took very quick and decisive actions and he saved the life of an inmate who was uh, at risk of imminent serious harm. And an item that I neglected to include that I wanted to mention in my report uh, is the, we did have some Veterans Day recognitions both for our incarcerated veterans um, and our staff. Um, in particular, I wanted to point out that we had uh, the last surviving Tuskegee Airman in Nebraska uh, visit our veterans unit in the jail. Uh, his name was Robert Holtz. Uh, it was very, uh, it, it was a very um, inspiring uh, ceremony, and it was uh, really special to see what honor and esteem the inmates in the veterans program held him in. You could see that they were very awestruck by his, his presence, uh, and it was a, it was a very uh, special thing for me to get to witness. With that, um, I will take any questions. Um. Uh, Commissioner Boyle, then Commissioner Morgan. Mike, thank you very much. It was a good report, and uh, uh, there's some questions that uh, came up to me, but I, I think what I'd like to do is uh, uh, ask that the board uh, members tell me when they might be available. We'll send out some dates, and I think uh, several years ago we had a meeting at your facility, mm -hmm. and it was uh, really interesting because we got into a lot of detail about what's taking place, and of course the uh, those who suffer from mental illness over there are, uh, it's a growing number and um, something that, uh, you know, we need to, uh, we're doing a fine job at it, but I think we need to do even more. Uh, so I'm going to propose a meeting over there when the commissioners can attend and we'll uh, um, do that and, and go through some things extensively. I wanted to ask you when you um, uh, talk about uh, SCRAM and uh, RAB and ROB and all that. RAB, RAB you defined, but SCRAM you didn't. And something when you use, uh, I'm surprised Commissioner Kraft didn't speak up. He's always a person on acronyms and sure. jargon. So anyway, I just mentioned that. that SCRAM, SCRAM is a, um, basically it's the name of a product and it's, it is a uh, alcohol detecting bracelet that we fix to oh, yeah, individuals' right. ankles who are on the 24-7 program. Right. Mark has one on his, <laughs> but not for that. Anyway, um, <laughs> Um, I also just want to briefly mention uh, I'm very happy about the personnel numbers. Those seem to be coming up pretty well. And uh, is that, uh, we, you know, we had a terrible problem earlier, and the board uh, stepped in and at the recommendation of uh, Dr. Foxhall and increased wages and 
it worked pretty well. But uh, that's important that you keep us on top of that, too. We Absolutely. appreciate it. And if you can let us know when these classes are graduating, <coughs> I think you did that in the past. We'll do. Uh, we'll certainly try to attend. Absolutely. Uh, I want to thank you and congratulate you on uh, taking over. Uh, actually, you were up to total speed when you stepped into the office and uh, took off. And um, so we'll, we'll plan a meeting where you come over and spend some time with you and, and listen to you even more carefully. Look forward to it. But I really appreciate the effort you and your uh, great chief deputy are doing, and uh, the staff has already seemed to be clicking real well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Morgan. Mike, uh, thank you very much. You said it kind of quickly, uh, the gentleman that saved a life there. Mm -hmm. Might be nice if we had him come before the board and maybe even had a resolution. Certainly. And thank him for that great service that occurred. I mean, that's Absolutely. really appreciated and, and, and I'd like to take this forum to talk to mention those things when they happen when they occur because they happen far more often than the public is aware um, that and, and in a variety some some of them are you know immediate actions that people take to save a life some of them are are, are just as important but they're more preventative in nature they, they catch something earlier on before it gets to the point of a, of a crisis um, but we have a great staff that uh, are vigilant and take their duties very seriously. And too often what we do hear are the opposite situations where one of our officers is assaulted or something else happens. Uh, so we want to be appreciative of that. The other thing I heard mentioned, you're running over on your budget a little bit, which Correct. Uh, I'm certain Joe Lorenz is um, listening carefully to that. Uh, hopefully we can get that and work with you to do whatever we can. The overtime, I know, has come down some, and I know you've got the class you just Correct. mentioned. Mm -hmm. How's that going? There, we still have overtime. Um, we still have ordered overtime. It has decreased. Um, we still have a little ways to go. Um, we did, we've had uh, some attrition in staff. Um, since I've taken over, well, that'll probably never go away completely. One of my highest priorities is, is working on the mentoring and ongoing support of younger officers so that we improve that staff retention over time. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about that with the training department um, and with throughout the ranks of the Fraternal Order of Police um, to uh, be able to set up some processes to better support our younger officers. Um, there's, um, you know, there, there are, we've had to catch up on some training um, that we had, had delayed when staffing was really uh, short. So that, you know, it's a necessity that we have to do to maintain compliance with certain standards. Um, that by conducting training, you are going to create some overtime because you're pulling people off of their posts and into a training room. Um, and the construction does take you know a few extra slots of, of staff who are uh, are assigned to uh, provide security around all the tools and the the contractors that are being utilized so um, hopefully like I said but I'm hoping by the end of the first quarter of 2019 we'll be very close uh, to where we need to be on our staffing levels okay and make sure you know if you need to talk to us and it's three of us at a time or whatever we'll be glad to come to your office if you say, here's a challenge I have and I'd like some input, not that we have the expertise you have or your staff has, but we want to be supportive and it's so important, the safety and doing the best that we can for those people that are held there in detention and so on, and to certainly be supportive of your staff and what they do each and every moment down there. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Duda. Um, I, I had a, well, I brag a lot about our 24-7 program, and not that I should get any credit for it, but the county, uh, it's a better way of, of handling these situations, just like drug court. I mean, we, we're, we're getting smarter in a lot of ways. My question is, uh, during a bad weather day here recently, they canceled, uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, we on, Correct. and I get that, you don't want people right putting themselves at risk to come in for the test. But I just wonder if somebody's on the 24-7 program and suddenly you say, hey, take a day off. 
does that have an adverse effect? I mean, if I were on that program, I'd think, oh, no testing today. Certainly. Um, is that a problem? So we, because of that concern, we're very cautious um, about canceling. We, we only when, you know, there's a travel advisory or the roads are particularly um, treacherous. Well, we, we, and we typically, it's maybe been once or twice per winter season since we've had the program operational that we have made the decision to cancel. It is typically only one session, not the whole day. So it's usually, right. you know, the morning or the evening session, whichever is most impacted by the weather. And we hope that the roads have improved by 12 hours later. Um, <clears throat> we also do not make the announcement that uh, testing I'm will be canceled until <laughs> within just, it, you sure. know, until within just a couple hours before testing is to begin so that individuals at the most, you know, they've got an extra couple of hours to play with in terms of time until their the next scheduled right. test is set. So we try to mitigate that risk, but it is it is balancing the risk of people seeing a window of opportunity to, to use a substance that they shouldn't compared with the risk of having people uh, travel to the, to the testing center during adverse weather conditions. Thank you. Commissioner Kraft. Yes. Um, under pretrial services, you show 90% compliance rate. Now, how does that compare with national statistics? Um, so what that is measuring is the amount of time that people are calling into the to the call-in system right. um, when they are supposed to be. I, I don't have a good comparison for that nationally because I don't know how many programs are set up in that way. Okay, that's um, a fair answer. I, I think that, you know, it's my hope that, you know, as we get further, you know, as I get my team assembled and we move forward uh, as a department, um, the whole topic of pretrial services will be something that's uh, um, a key priority in terms of, of enhancing that program, continuing to build upon some of the changes that we made last year, getting those to become more um, ingrained in the s criminal justice system so they're, they're utilized more frequently. And, and you'll probably see a whole different sort of report for pretrial <laughs> services as we make those changes. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. All right. Okay, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Is there a motion to adjourn the uh, board of the court? There's a motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Kraft. Please vote. Motion passes. All commissioners voting yes. We're now called to order the board of commissioners meeting. Roll call, please. Commissioner Borgeson? Here. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Commissioner Duda? Here. Commissioner Kraft? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Item one is minutes and claims. Approval of the minutes of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners meeting held Tuesday, December 4, 2018. Item B is approval of claims submitted for payment and processed through Tuesday, December 11, 2018. What's the will of the board? The approval of Motion by Commissioner Duda. Sure. Second by Commissioner uh, Morgan. Not uh, Kraft. <laughs> Kraft. Uh, Please I'll be vote. abstaining as there's a check in there to my company. Motion passes. Commissioner Morgan abstaining. All the commissioners voting yes. Item uh, two is consent agenda. There's 12 items under consent agenda. What's the will of the board? Yes. I would like uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, to speak on. Is it to him or is it Hitler? Is it? Let's see. Sorry. Uh, item uh, A. Okay. Is there a motion to second? Yes, I'll make the motion. Motion by Commissioner Boyle, second. second by Commissioner Morgan. David, you've been requested <clears throat> to speak to item A. Good morning. Good morning. Douglas County Emergency Communications Director. Uh, what I would like you to do, David, is uh, uh, we spoke about this uh, contract that uh, you've managed to negotiate, which is very, very significant. Uh, if you could, I'd like you to uh, tell the board what the important points are and the public as well, uh, what the main uh, bullet points are of, uh, of your efforts. Sure. Sure. This is an interlocal agreement. It's not a contract as of yet. The contract will hopefully follow in the near future for this purchase. But this is an agreement between Orion, the, uh, the original Regional Interoperable Communications Committee, 
or commission or group that got together to enlarge our regional area to include Sarpy County. The advantage of this will be that you'll have basically seamless communications, the same kind of communications capability we have already in our Orion region will extend to Sarpy. That's one of the advantages of it. The other advantages are where we then have a what's called a dynamic system resiliency. In other words, a backup controller. The controller is pretty much the brains of your radio network nowadays because your radio networks are computer systems more than they are our basic radio systems like in the past. So we would have a um, continuous, redundant, totally mirrored dynamic system resilient controller. So the controller of the brains of it. So if anything happened to our existing controller, the Sarpy County controller would automatically take over without any kind of human intervention. So that's a positive. Another positive is there's cost savings in adding another entity to the Orion group in the future when it comes to our, our software purchases, software maintenance, software agreements. So, and the ultimate uh, advantage of this is you'll have public safety responders having radio communications at the same level as Orion all the way through the region now to now include SARPI. Um, on a side note, Dodge County has contacted the Orion Group, and you probably have read about that. They're, they have contracted or are contracting for their county uh, radio system to be upgraded. They have expressed an interest to also come on to the Orion Group at some time in the future. It's probably be a year or two before they're ready. So the advantage of this, if you can take a map of our area and envision of this, is have a backup controller, totally mirrored, any time can take over in case one controller fails. You have a public safety unit or entity that could drive all the way from the farthest point of Dodge County to the southernmost part of Sarpy County and have the same radio communications capability Amazing. as any other entity in that region. So it works towards our goal of interoperability, redundancy, cost savings, and overall um, services to the public ultimately are going to be improved when people can communicate, your responders can communicate at a standardized level all through the region. Great. Well, it's a remarkable uh, and significant step toward uh, uh, something we hoped would happen for a long time. And um, I want to congratulate you for being uh, one of the important players in getting this put together and also thank the other counties for uh, their interest in cooperating uh, in the interest of public safety. Thank you. The real credit for this needs to go to our systems administrator, Chris Allen. He has worked behind the scenes for, we've been working at this for a long time, basically since I've been here two yep. years ago. But he has done a lot behind the scenes because these systems are so technical that it requires a lot of expertise and research development. And I would like to thank the, uh, the people or my contacts down in Sarpy County on uh, the public safety side were, were excellent. Um, Good. So, well, any thank you. Any other questions? Not from me. Thank you very much, David. All right. Okay. Thank you. Great report. There's a motion to second. Motion. No, there's already one. There's one, so I just want to make sure. Uh, please vote. Of uh, a relationship with Susan Clark as an employee. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, Commissioner Morgan abstaining. All other commissioners voting yes. Item three is recognition and proclamations. Um, item A is a resolution honoring the career of Alan R. Jackson, who is retiring December 14th, 2018, after working for Douglas County for 24 years. And item B is the recognition of the of county employee Charles Steiner, who is retiring from Douglas County Clerk Comptroller's Office after 18 years of service to the citizens of Douglas County. Now, Alan uh, is not here, uh, but I want to uh, thank Alan personally for his service, uh, particularly the work he's done down there at our, in our Veterans Department. Um, we'll be later on the agenda appointing a new person to replace him, but um, despite him not being here, I want to thank him not only for his you know, service to the country, but to the department and what he's done. With that, uh, Mr. Clerk, my understanding is you want to speak to item B. Good 
morning, Dan Ash, Douglas County Clerk. Uh, before I get to Chuck Steiner, I just want to say uh, uh, we have uh, veterans can file their DD-214s in the clerk's office, so we do have a relationship with the Veterans Service Office, and owls sometimes uh, come by to stop by the payroll office, and uh, we have several people in the clerk's office that are uh, quite fond of owls, so we're, we're going to miss them. Uh, on the Charles Steiner, uh, Chuck Steiner, um, I guess I feel like I've been coming up here far too often these last couple years, but Chuck's another longtime uh, county employee. He started off with Douglas County Information Services in 2000, and then in 2005 he was with .com, and then in uh, 2006 he's been in the Clerk Comptroller's Office as an Oracle functional lead and uh, he's been there in that role ever since. Um, he really plays a he's behind the scenes person. Uh, you know, I think the majority of the public probably doesn't know who Charles Steiner is, but a lot of people who work for the county and dot com and the building commission and even the city of Omaha, they know who Chuck is because he plays such a pivotal role in making sure that Oracle's working right. I mean, we use Oracle for so much of what we do, and if there's, um, you know, an issue, there could be uh, some real problems. So Chuck plays uh, one of the people that plays a real pivotal role in just making sure that our government operates. So um, he's definitely going to be missed, uh, not only because he's good at what he does, but just because he's a a great guy. Um, as far as him being knowledgeable, and I, a couple months ago when we made, when Chuck, uh, we made the announcement that Chuck was retiring, I ran into somebody who used to work in the clerk's office, and they came up to me, they didn't even say hello, they were just like, Chuck's retiring? And I, I was like, oh, yeah, hi, uh, yeah, he's going to be gone in the middle of December. And like, well, what are you going to do? And so, <laughs> so, yeah, so, as we have a, we have a solid uh, employee, uh, taken over for him, but I'll admit there was a time where I was feeling a bit anxiety about it. Um, and Chuck, the other thing about him is, you know, when we get phone calls, um, sometimes it is an Oracle issue, but there's also quite a few times where it's an issue with the Oracle user. Uh, but Chuck always listens and remains calm and will walk people through, uh, you know, what they're, what they're doing wrong and help them out. And, um, I think that's why people are going to miss him because when he, when there was an issue, he would work hard until it got fixed. And if there wasn't an issue, he was uh, always kind and respectful uh, in how he went about helping people figure it out. So, um, and last thing, I think you've heard me talk. I have quite a few funny people that work in the clerk's office, and he's up there. He's one of them, and uh, I. If you all know him, it's probably isn't that funny to you, but he's just, he's, he can be kind of animated sometimes when he's uh, talking, uh, like when he gets a, a phone call that, he, you know, he doesn't know what's going on or he gets an idea, you know, and he, it's, it's just, he's, uh, I've gotten used to it over the years, but the other day, two weeks ago, he came in and kind of had one of those stories for me and I was just thinking, I was like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss this, so. Um, I'll just read the resolution real quick, if you don't mind. Uh, Whereas Douglas County, Nebraska, recognizes that its employees are the county's most important asset and resource for providing quality service to the citizens of Douglas County. And whereas on July 24, 2000, Charles Chuck Steiner began working at Douglas County Information Services as a system analyst. And whereas during his time with DCIS, Chuck Steiner played an integral role in the implementation of Oracle as Douglas County's enterprise resource planning system. And whereas in August 2005, Chuck Steiner would begin working for the Douglas Omaha Technology Commission. And whereas on June 12, 2006, Chuck Steiner began working in the Douglas County Clerk Comptroller's Office as an Oracle functional lead and remained in that role up until his retirement from Douglas County. And whereas although Chuck Steiner was an employee of the County Clerk Comptroller's Office, he provided Oracle assistance to employees from every Douglas County department, dot com, the Omaha Douglas Building, Public Building Commission in the City of Omaha, and whereas Chuck Steiner always desired to be helpful and professional and regularly made himself available to coworkers, consultants, and others when assistance was needed, even if it wasn't related to his job duties, and whereas Chuck Steiner always performed his duties with the intention of doing what was best for the citizens of Douglas County, 
and whereas Douglas County wishes to recognize Chuck Steiner on his retirement after 18 years of dedicated service. Now, therefore, be it resolved by this Board of County Commissioners, Douglas County, Nebraska, that this board hereby recognizes Chuck Steiner for his dedicated and outstanding service to the residents and employees of Douglas County and thankfully presents this resolution as testimony thereof dated this 11th day of December 2018. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. There is a motion and a second on A and B. Any other comment? Seeing none, please vote. And, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, we actually did not uh, hear who made the motion in the I'll second. Move. Second. Okay, that's fine. You got it. Commissioner Cavanaugh's motion, second by Commissioner Sorry. Yes, thank you. And we are, uh, give us one moment here. <laughs> All right, thank you. Please vote. Motion passes. All commissioners voting yes. Item four is citizens' comments. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on a board of commissioners related items not uh, listed on today's agenda. Are there any citizens' comments? Anybody else wants to speak first, please be free to do so. My name is Larry Storr, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha. Um, I'd like to take a little bit different approach this morning in the name of transparency. A little humor, maybe. Three transparent cups or shells, if you want to call them that. One could be a taxpayer, one could be a county board, one could be a city council. But generally under one of them is the taxpayer who picks up the bill for uh, expenditures. Uh, expenditures can be included, uh, some of the, as mentioned on the radio by the mayor yesterday, <clears throat> philanthropics. Some of your expenditures go to philanthropics for programs, but doesn't that sort of come out of my pocket eventually? <clears throat> and most of these organizations probably raise money privately from donations. Why should they be getting donations from a city council or Douglas County Board? I'm not against all of them, but there, there is a point where when things have to be cut or sliced, maybe those are the ones that should be cut or sliced. <clears throat> In the name of transparency, as we often hear here, also, uh, do you ever wonder why there's not more citizens down here today wanting to comment? A lot of them work. Uh, a lot of them just aren't able to keep up with the daily record and the various other things that really aren't that easily available. It's not reported in the newspaper. It's not reported on the local TV channels. And we don't all have cable. But uh, yesterday, the mayor used that term in relation to various things that if we spend it, they will come. Well, interesting article in the World Herald the other day related to Nodo <clears throat> that, oh my goodness, the retail market has changed. We can't have, uh, always have retail locations on the ground floor of these new buildings that are going up a lot of them with tax increment financing, which again comes out of the taxpayers uh, thing eventually. Uh, so if, if the retail market has changed, maybe we're in a deep trouble here with all of the TIF financing. Of all the buildings that are mixed use, high-rise high apartments or high uh, upscale apartments, small retail establishments that they can't all compete against every everybody some of some of them are going to fail and then some of them are going to walk away and maybe the owners of the buildings will walk away but mean meantime did they get an exemption from property taxes for 15 years if they do walk away who collects the property tax those are questions that citizens would like to know but if the retail market has changed, maybe we better rethink some of our decisions. Thank you. 
and I bequeath these to the city, uh, the Douglas County Board, and in honor of Mike Boyle and uh, Mr. Cavanaugh. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments? Or, or could be for the city. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioners. Marty Hosking, 7510 Cass Street. I uh, just wanted to register my opposition to going forward with the Juvenile Justice Center as presented so far, as, as I've been informed so far. Um, I, I, I want to uh, register my interest in separating that from the uh, uh, spending that will occur to extend the uh, Douglas County uh, Courthouse Services uh, badly needed, I, I understand. Um, however, I would like to, again, register my uh, opposition to mixing that with the juvenile justice um, proposal uh, that uh, is not consistent with the findings of the study that was done and funded by the county uh, as to the best interests of the juveniles. Uh, in addition, uh, there's been uh, loud opposition by people who are either residents of and or business owners in the area. For those of us who know a little thing or two, even if it's an armchair knowledge of good Four Corners development in walkable, uh, creating walkable residential areas, we know that a block of anything that doesn't have good ground connection with the sidewalk, with pedestrians, and with the neighborhood does not help to grow the neighborhood, and that is a real need that we have in Omaha, I think many of you will agree, that millennials are looking for places to build their lives and their businesses, and we really need to support them. And I feel that uh, this is a step in the wrong direction to, quote unquote, kill another block with something that doesn't connect directly with the residential nature of, of the area. So, i.e., uh, retail, coffee shops, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, Flatiron Restaurant needs our support to be able to continue to, to do well there and to contribute to that growth in that area. So I do have a lot of concern for that and I hope that uh, you will insist on clear numbers about what costs will be and what they will be for for the justice system, uh, the Juvenile Justice Center and what cost might be entailed in remaining on the campus that it is currently that is recommended as best practices in the field of juvenile justice. If we can spend less money in promoting that and building up that and renewing that, that is for the citizens of Omaha, for the fiduciary responsibility that you have to us, the best option, or it should be done carefully. I was at a meeting recently where one of the commissioners was there and I asked questions and that commissioner did not have detailed answers about numbers and costs. And that disturbed me and it concerned me. Uh, you have a fiduciary responsibility to really look into this very deeply. And I feel that up to now that it's not been done. And going forward the way we are with the MUD thing isn't still addressing the fundamental concerns that we have. So thank you. Anyone else? Morning. My name is Tyler Olson. I'm a resident of Omaha. Um, I'm here today to talk about the same thing I've talked about for all, almost the last six months now. Um, you know, there was a, a meeting with the MUD Board of Directors um, that Commissioner Duda was there. And um, there's some things that I, I kind of want to point out from that. Um, I'd like to thank the MUD Board of Directors for having an open and transparent discussion about this matter that um, unfortunately hasn't been very transparent up until recently. Um, you know, Commissioner Duda, you had said that um, the detention side of this might not even be part of the plan anymore. Um, from every schematic that I've seen, it still is, um, and that's alarming. Um, the other thing, you said that the um, Nebraska Crime Commission is on board with this project. Um, there hasn't been a letter of intent. There hasn't been a needs assessment submitted to them. And all of those things have to take place 
before you can build a detention center or a jail or whatever you want to call it. There are, there are things that need to happen in a process for this to continue. And I, I spoke here a while back about how the Nebraska Jail Standards Board had to sign off on A, B, and C before this project can go through. And I got looks of, you know, you have no idea what you're talking about. And here we are. And I really think that you as a board, you need to take two steps backward to go one step forward. Let's slow down. Let's take good hard looks at these things and let's figure out the next step forward. Let's get a needs assessment done. Let's get a strategic plan done. None of these things that I've seen, none of these things that I've been able to find on public record, where, where's the assessment that is a needs assessment that says this is going to happen if we build this new building? You know, the other thing is the allotted beds is going to be 48 beds. Well, in a correctional facility, you can only use 75 to 80 percent of those beds. So how about rather than building the building and then dropping the population, we drop the population to that 48, 35 mark, and then we build the new building. Let's take the programs that you say that we're going to implement, <coughs> let's implement them now, fine-tune them, fine them to when they work flawlessly, and then we build the new building to accommodate those things. It, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me to build the new building and then do all these things. Why don't we do these things and then make the largest expenditure in the history of Douglas County? It's, it's backwards to me and it doesn't make sense. And we've been asking for six months for that clarity and to justify how this makes sense and we don't get it. And we've been asking and we've been asking and we've been asking and we don't get it. Um, you know, I attended the, the 501c3 meeting yesterday um, in 903, and um, it really blows my mind that we make this big deal about how we're going to be transparent and there's going to be a website for things, and yet at the bottom of the agenda it says you must email your questions prior to asking them so we know what you're asking. Like. How is that transparent? How is that being open and having open discussion? It, does, it just doesn't make sense to me. And for the last six months, I've been asking for that clarity, and I've been asking for those answers, and I haven't got them. So I ask you today, like I've asked you for the last six months, slow down. Let's take some time to figure this out. Let's take some time to figure out if we're going to use the dot-com building and the OHA building or if we're going to use the MUD building. You're still waiting on a response for MUD, whether they're going to sell the building. You're still waiting on litigation to finish with the dot-com and OHA block. So why is there such a big rush? Take your time, slow down, plan it accordingly. No one argues that we don't need a courthouse annex. Nobody. Commissioner Boyle and I went and walked through the public defender's office. They're cramped. It's ridiculous, and we need to fix that. So let's build a courthouse annex. But let's wait on a detention center to make sure that's actually the answer to the problem, and let's make sure that we actually truly need it. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I'd ask you to stop the clapping, please. Luis Jimenez, 518 North 40th Street. Good morning. I want to comment on your rules of order for this board. Rule 8, authorized committees, states, the chair shall appoint the following committees whose membership may consist of two to three commissioners. Um, administrative Services Committee is listed un under that rule. Recently, the Administrative Services Committee produced an alternative plan which proposed building a 12-story justice center in downtown and keeping youth detention at the current location. It is a proper proposal which required official, reconsider or official consideration. Furthermore, on your rules, your Rule 12, Appearances Before the Board, Item B, Citizens' Remarks During Any Citizens' Comments periods 
debate of board actions and during any public hearing may not exceed five minutes. Citizens' remarks may be extended with consent of the chair of the board of the county commissioners. It doesn't say anything about uh, limiting debate. Um, proactive engagement between a commissioner and a citizen is okay. You can proceed with it. However, there is a note on this agenda prohibiting this. It says, however, under the Open Meetings Act, agenda item should give some notice of the matter to be considered by the board so that the public will know which matters are under consideration. As a result, the board will not debate or take action on any item presented during citizens' comments. Nobody's asking you to take action when we speak to you. We want you to listen. We want to know what you guys feel or speak on these matters. So um, you didn't vote on it. You didn't vote on this. Ask the county attorney if you think I'm wrong. Through this year, there's been talk about words being important. Even Bruce Carpenter of JCDC chimed in, um, chimed in, and he said that um, terms matter, words matter, it's a nonprofit, he says. He'll tell you any shit you want to hear. You really hey, will. Whoa, 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 whoa. Luis. What's that? I'm going to ask you not to use profanity. If so, I'm going to cut you off. I'm almost done, sir. Do you, un no, do you understand what I just told you? Do you understand what I just asked you? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to be clear. Okay. Well, I apologize for that, but he really will. If I cannot, um, so my last piece is uh, to do with uh, infrastructure. And I did not, uh, you know what, I'll save that for another time because I didn't, uh, completely edited this correct, so it fits with my comments, so I'll hold off on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Seeing none. Oh, sorry. Um, I would just like a point of clarification that there will be uh, citizen comments available during the uh, item 7A finance and discussion of the MUD purchase. It, that topic has been touched on a couple of times here this morning so far. It's an agenda item will be discussed. If you're going to discuss that, then you should wait till that item. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll go on. I'm going to do a um, quick alteration here and go to item F in human services. Uh, I, that item is item one, approval of the Veterans Service Committee's recommendation to hire Vincent L. Moore as the Douglas County Veterans Service Officer. My understanding, sir? If I may, please, Chair, Commissioner, just, do. The, this does fall to my committee. I would like, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce the head of our Veterans Service Committee, Dr. Stephen Youngberg, who is going to introduce our new staff person. Uh, the committee has uh, done detail of interviewing the uh, participants uh, for the position, and our recommendation is Vincent Elmore. Uh, he's an excellent choice to run that particular office of Veterans Affairs. That's the services. I just want to say I thank uh, Dr. Youngberg uh, and the rest of the committee members for the nomination. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to serve in this capacity as director, and I look forward to continuing the culture and climate for uh, the Better Serve Veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Appreciate it. Is there a motion to second? Move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Duda, second by Commissioner Boyle. Please vote. Motion passes. Need, All commissioners the, the yes. commissioners want to meet you, so if you want to come on up. Okay, we're going to go back up to um, item eight, 
under committee discussion, which is finance. Item one is the uh, budget report, Commissioners Boyle and Morgan. As presented, and now uh, we are having some meetings with Joe Lorenz, and then we'll be involving all the commissioners as we continue on. Quick comment. Uh, what, what we're meeting for is um, uh, PJ and I are talking, Commissioner Morgan and I are talking to uh, Mr. Lorenz about uh, places where we might be able to um, uh, do some uh, cutting in budgets. We'll check in with the elected officials. We're not going to be doing this and the department heads uh, without their participation. But we have a, a real serious need for uh, treating the mentally ill, and we need to come up with some money. And uh, in cooperation with all the other board members, we need to decide uh, on what we want to do, what our priorities are, and I think this rises uh, to the top in a lot of cases. Not only for people who are incarcerated, uh, people who are suffering from mental illness uh, uh, on a daily basis. So we want to try to do something to uh, answer this need because it is uh, it's critical. We have people, I think we have 72 people waiting uh, for placement in a psychiatric unit and that is just not acceptable. So that's what we're heading for is trying to figure out how to respond to the, come up with some money to uh, do some mental health work. So I appreciate the cooperation so far and you'll be, we'll keep you informed. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll move to item two, a discussion of the resolution to direct Douglas County Attorney's Office and the Douglas County Public Properties Director to formally offer to purchase the MUD real estate and complete purchase agreement on behalf of, the, of Douglas County uh, for $6 million. Uh, Miss, uh, to the, I'll address the, ask the county attorney to address the context of what we have for us. Uh, Teresa York, Deputy County Attorney. So we've placed on the board's agenda for consideration for discussion for today an item that would, uh, possibly lead us into more formal discussions with MUD. It's our office's intent to bring this back again next week for action. So today will be discussion to talk about whether we should enter into uh, more formal discussions with MUD about possibly purchasing their property, which is across the street from the courthouse. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will open it up for any comment now from the public, and then we'll address from the board. Hello all, Brian Smith, 6516 Emmett Street. Um, I served on the Board of Trustees for the Business Ethics Alliance here in Omaha for seven years. And one of the uh, actions that the, the uh, <clears throat> Business Ethics Alliance took is it uh, did a, an assessment of the ethical atmosphere of Omaha, the key ethical components of what we do as a city. Those are accountability, community responsibility, financial vitality, integrity, and moral courage. And these five ethical standards are what they determined drive Omaha. Unfortunately, <clears throat> as business ethics, they may not apply here to community service. Uh, I would like to call attention, I have a transcript of the MUD board meeting from last week, December 5th, in which Commissioner Duda spoke and addressed a question that uh, Gwen Howard presented in regards to federal uh, approval for a detention center. Claire Duda said, I can tell you that the State Jail Standards Board, which is what I've always worried about, is on board. That was on December 5th. Unfortunately, that is a false statement. As of yesterday, <clears throat> I spoke with Denny Maycomber, who is the director of the Jail Standards Division at the Nebraska Crime Commission. And he confirmed in an email here that I have um, that he yesterday received a letter from uh, Commissioner Rogers dated December 3rd, sent by Karen Cole, Monday at 2.25 p.m., announcing the county's intent to build. Um, he also said that uh, a representative from HDR forwarded the uh, architectural renderings and the Chin report, which was in his email, or he says in his mail on Monday morning. I will begin reviewing the documents we have received on Friday. The Jail Standards Division has, is not on board with the new detention center. That is a misrepresentation to the MUD board. There is no such approval because they have not received, uh, as of yesterday, 
uh, yesterday afternoon, they had not received the documents and they have not reviewed them. They have not approved your intent to build a detention center. Unfortunately, this is not the first time <clears throat> that a member of this commission has spread misinformation regarding the status of a proposed detention center. Several members of this commission have also misled the public to facilitate this real estate deal by saying that children would not be in shackles. One of you got that in the World Herald this week. This board, this county board, does not make that determination. That determination is made by the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Guess what? Have you talked to Captain Sellers? I have. Captain Sellers says this policy is made by the Douglas County uh, Sheriff's Office and will not change. As elected officials, you've used your offices to grant yourselves private oversight of the largest building project in county history, followed yesterday by no bid contracts for campaign donors. You are, voting, you are avoiding a public vote on tax increase, trying to slide this through back channels. The time for trust is over. Commissioner Rogers, I've repeatedly asked you during the course of the last five months to explain how a 48 bed facility would accommodate the 80 kids that we currently hold in detention. And, it, and during one of these meetings, you said, trust me. The tr time for trust has passed. This board has repeatedly violated the public trust and our shared sense of ethics. You are spreading misinformation to accomplish your goals and are not on the side of the people. In light of these issues, and in this uh, issue we're discussing a $6 million real estate acquisition, I ask for a delay of the vote, not for a week, but until Commissioner Rogers can produce a document that shows specifically his paradigm shift using county data, not the Chin Report, which shows six statistically flawed forecast models ranging from 133 kids in detention to negative 102. And unless you're uh, operating a uh, juvenile maternity ward, I'm not sure how you get fewer kids coming out of detention than going in. You need to res uh, reveal specific programs that allow for the use of this $6 million acquisition to build your jail. We deserve the right to know who, what, when, where, why, and how this paradigm shift will be accomplished. And I'm asking that Commissioner Rogers send this plan to the county clerk by Monday, December 17th, so it can be reviewed by the public and board of commissioners before a vote is taken. Thank you. Anyone else? Captain Eric Sellers, Douglas County Sheriff's Office, 1616 Leavenworth. I want to clear up uh, one statement, which isn't completely true. When we spoke four months ago or three months ago, said at times we may not need to shackle them, at times we will shackle. We still will not give a blanket statement that they will or will not be shackled. There are times juveniles will be shackled because they're a, a risk, and many times they won't need to be if we move across the building. We're moving them down the hall from a secure facility right into court. No, we won't shackle them. So I want to make sure that's clear here. When you say what I told, you're not saying the whole story. I told you when we spoke, there are times we will and times we will not. I won't let the public determine what our policies are. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Those who are concerned about the juveniles, if this building is in a, at another location, they're going to be transported in a van um, where they're held all day. If it's across the street, if we don't need them, they're going to come across the hall. They will not be shackled. They will then go back to their, the youth center, the, whatever you want to call it here, and they can continue with their um, programs they have, and they won't be stuck here all day. So that is our official statement. Uh, policies have not changed yet because we're way too far into this. And if you have any questions. Thank you, Captain. No problem. Yeah, well, Captain, you do have a question. Absolutely. Commissioner Kevin, sorry. <clears throat> currently, Lieutenant? Captain. Captain. Uh, currently, um, the transport that you handle uh, from the youth center on 42nd Street to um, the court facilities here um, involve uh, how many children per day on average? It changes, but let's just say an average of six to seven. 
Um, I, I don't know if it was you, but we asked for a survey in August to take mm -hmm. a month and see, um, and it, I think averaged about four, but, you know, four to six would be fair, do you yeah, think? Yeah, there's, there's not a large number. Right. And some days there are none. That could be accurate. Okay. The policy to shackle mm -hmm. those individual children uh, is, a, is a department policy, correct? Correct. Okay. And that's based on what? It's a policy. Ha it's always been that way, and it just we haven't looked at it since. Then. I understand. But um, other than we've always done it this way, is there an articulable reason to do that? Well, you could say it's for a couple different reasons, for our security, for their security, uh, so nobody runs or attempts to run. Right. And um, I'm sure that the Sheriff's Department studies best practices in other jurisdictions uh, where uh, children are transported without shackling. Are you aware of those? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, would it be helpful for the department to familiarize themselves with situations similar to the one that we currently uh, have here, where transporting children, uh, where shackles are not used? Yeah, it could be, but I, I guess the main thing is we, we can't have a blanket statement they will never be shackled. There are always going to be situations where a juvenile being transported in a van will be shackled. And there are other times where maybe they don't need to be, but that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, currently, there are holding facilities in the Hall of Justice uh, for individuals, children, and adults awaiting disposition, uh, adjudication, call it what you will. And those are uh, under the auspices of the Sheriff's Department, right? Correct. Okay. And when an individual is taken from that holding facility in the Hall of Justice now to the courtroom and back, um, are they shackled? Yes. Okay. So in this new facility, you're saying that, that that would be the same or that there would be a change of policy there? We will, if we're leaving the detention facility. Correct. From one the holding door, facility. The holding. Right. Walking down a 20-foot, 30-foot hallway to the courtroom, in most cases, they would not be, need to be shackled. But there are going to still be cases where, they, you know, murderers, um, Anybody that's a flight risk or they, they're, they're fighting, we're going to have to determine that. There are cases where they still will be shackled. Okay. And is that the standard that you use in the Hall of Justice currently relative to transporting these people from the holding facility to the courtroom? No, everybody, everybody is shackled right now. Everybody is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're going to do a judgment call in the, the, under the new scenario whether or not it's necessary for public safety uh, either of the individual or the officer or the public at large to use and employ shackles? Well, there are a few diff a couple differences here. Now, when we leave our holding facility up on 6th floor, if you will, with the juveniles, we're going across the rotunda into areas that are no longer secured. You know, there are members of the public or family there and available. In the new, if, if everything goes across the street, everything will stay and remain in a secure hallway until that person goes in front of a judge and there will not be access to the public. And the security for that facility will be provided by the Sheriff's Department? Yes. And that will involve uh, new personnel that are currently not on staff down here providing security to that complex? That's correct. And have you estimated the scope and cost of that security detail? Um, we've, we've talked about it, but until we, until we get further in the process or we know exactly what it's going to look like, we, it's hard to tell. So you have a six-story Hall of Justice over mm -hmm. here that you currently provide this security for, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you have a detail specifically dedicated to that security, correct? Correct. How big is that detail? As far as manpower? Right. Approximately 40 people. I'm sorry? 40. Say again. I, I, I'm sorry. Approximately 40. Four zero? Yes. 40 people. And do you have the... Um, idea, and if you don't, just say you don't, and we'll find it, uh, what the annual cost of that 40-person detail I is. I do not. Okay. This is a six-story structure that we're talking about in the Hall of Justice, correct? Correct. And it would be approximately the same or maybe a little larger across the street. Is that right? As far as you know. As far as I know. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Morgan. Champion, uh, Thank you for coming down. I think Brad will recall I did ask 
if it was almost daily that we're transporting the youth down mm -hmm. with two deputies. And he did tell me that it was most every day that that occurred. And I see that Brad here shaking his head, and I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot. I appreciate what you're doing, and I understand why you have to have those needs at certain times and not other needs. I visited uh, the several of the facilities, one being in Maricopa County, mm -hmm. and they have a facility where everything's there, the courts, the detention center, the attorneys, and so on, and I saw them coming down the hallway, um, and they're not shackled, just what you said, and that was a case that we saw up in Minneapolis and St. Paul in downtown facility where everything's together. So I thank you for the work all of you do thank as you. a sheriff. And by statute, the sheriff's office is the one, they are the ones, to take care of the courts in our facilities here. And that's by statute. So I thank you for the work and your people's work because it's not always an easy task. And that's for certain. And you don't always know uh, the situation that could and has occurred in a number of places throughout our country. Thank you. So we thank you. It. We appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Boyle. For your information. Uh, the, uh, and I also appreciate the testimony that was very enlightening uh, from Brian. Uh, I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, I think one of the, in all these conversations that have been taking place, um, there, there's some talk of, uh, you know, uh, categorizing the people who are in the youth center, call them children, call them kids, and uh, they are and they aren't. Um, I asked the director, Brad Alexander, for not identifying the people, but tell us who's in there for what charges. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a tough, it is a very tough crowd. Uh, you know, people talk about we need open space and green lawns and all that. Uh, that's not exactly um, who we're dealing with. And so that's why the shackles are necessary. That's why the sheriff's office makes these decisions. No one wants to see anybody shackled, and certainly a young person, because it does set them uh, in a path, helps to set them, unfortunately, in a path uh, that we don't want them to go on, but they ha are already on that path. You know, we have, a, I know a, the list that I got from uh, the director of uh, the youth center, uh, one person's in there for a second degree, accused of second degree murder, uh, there are three that are in there for felonious assaults with weapons and also domestic violence and so forth. Uh, these are not <clears throat> the youngsters that you see um, when you go to a high school or someplace necessarily. These are people who have, are off the rails. And so uh, we need to keep that in mind, and the sheriff's office will take care of what has to happen. No one wants to see them in shackles, but unfortunately because of their illnesses and their attitudes, uh, they have to be. And uh, so I appreciate what you're doing and that you came up in the work that you do. I do want to mention something. I received a phone call from uh, Commissioner Rogers while I was out of town Merry Thanksgiving <clears throat> and uh, talked about the MUD th uh, building. And uh, he said something to me that I know that he meant, but I, I cannot get this communicated very well. Um, he talked about the necessity of having all the services and all the, all the uh, youth and all the backup and all this sort of thing met everybody right in one place. And I said, you know, Chris, what makes you think that I don't want to do that? It's just the location. So uh, uh, I'll talk a little, uh, well, I'll say it now. I, I think the, situa the location at 42nd Street offers uh, much more opportunity for flexibility. If we find out that uh, we have to exceed the number of beds, uh, we've got space where we can do something. Uh, in this building, we won't. We will be locked in to a, a certain amount of space on a floor uh, downtown that uh, there's just nothing we can do except, oh, maybe we'll move the county attorney out. <laughs> so, I mean, we're dedicated to that building if we do this. And uh, the comments that Mr. Hosky made are absolutely on point. Uh, I was speaking with Commissioner Borgeson yesterday about the need to begin holding these 501c3 meetings here at the beginning of our county board meeting uh, because um, <clears throat> It, it needs to be much more public, and it is public upstairs in the 903. There's no question about that. But <clears throat> it is, um, it's really the law, but it's not the spirit of the open meetings law because people can't attend. They don't get to see this on Cox Cable, whatever it is. And um, uh, 
perception is what matters and we did talk about that and the county board we think i don't but the majority of the board i believe thinks we've been totally transparent on this whole operation and we have been according to law but not according to what we should be doing with the public the taxpayers are not fully informed about this and it is the perception so we need to we need to get up to speed on the perception because that is what matters so in any event i really appreciate your comments and i appreciate what people have said so far so those are the comments i want to make to this point thank you captain no thank you commissioner Kraft. yes um i'm on the board of the autism center of nebraska and one of the counselors there was talking about one of their students or youth who's transported in shackles and how traumatic it was that it took three months of counseling when he was only in the youth center for a day and a half because he was transported in shackles to the courthouse um, he was not found guilty of anything but the trauma and the effect on our staff at the autism center was amazing and, and yeah that is one of the reasons why I don't think you'd shackle that young person if he's down the hall from the courtroom um, how do you treat special needs youth and young people you know we we don't see um, the special needs a lot that I'm aware of right now everybody's treated the same as far as being shackled um, I guess the thing I want to uh, go a little further on here is most juveniles when they when they, they go to when they're arrested and they go to the youth center um, intake will release those that do not belong there there are those there that have violent crimes um, on their record and or they need placement a lot of those juveniles or you want to call them offenders are coming over for murder robbery there are a portion there and for those charges I don't see anything changing or for our security they will still be shot and, and I would agree if they're in for murder or violent crime that's that's different we need to protect you and the public um, you meaning the sheriffs sure okay thank you in the courts um, but so many of the young people commit crimes because they have mental illness because of situations that shouldn't happen in the first place such as family violence and the continuation of it so yeah my concern is and, and commissioner rogers has explained many times how we can get to 48 beds except people don't want to accept that explanation and if they read the studies i've read six different studies including the chin report um, uh, not including the chin report excuse me uh, having the youth near the courthouse is a tremendous asset for the youth and their families because families are a very important part of this and some of the opponents to this don't realize how important the family is so that, that's all I wanted to say thank you Commissioner do thank you one of the one of the things and I Minneapolis and, and st. Paul were very educational me and I appreciate your being up there and it was interesting uh, to see actually how the how the system can be greatly improved upon and I get that there will always be some kids that need to be handcuffed and shackled I I get that but I think that the way we are going we're going to be able to eliminate the vast majority of the times that we are, are having to do that what Commissioner Boyle um, this this is for you one of the points that they made in Minneapolis is that if we keep referring to them as those kids, we'll never take ownership. If we say, we don't see those kids in high school, these kids are all off the rails. Even if they're pre-adjudicated, we already know they're off the rails. Until we start saying, these are our children, and they may not all be off the rails. That's the purpose of the courts, is to find out. But until we start treating these as our children, we're never going to take ownership. We're never going to try to improve the system. Um, that was a real important point for me. These are our children, and we're trying to figure out the best future, the best way to handle our children. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
I know, uh, Commissioner Boyd. Well, I, I appreciate your comments, and I agree with him, Commissioner. Uh, what I'm talking about are these young people are in trouble off the rails is maybe not quite right, but they are accused of things, and they're, some of them are dangerous, some of them are not. Uh, but, you know, I've heard over and over, and I think all of us have, that people want to see us stop, get, it, get in front of this to try to prevent those young people from getting into trouble. That's really going to be difficult, but that's part of what we're charged with, what we're being asked to do. And I think the school systems and all the rest of them have to participate. But obviously, obviously there are children. I, I, I don't, I'm not really, I'm almost offended by what you say, but I'm uh, probably the most liberal member of this board. I know. And so, I mean, they I mean, are, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a definitely bleeding heart kind of a guy. Well, I, so, I, mean, I, I recognize that. I okay, it. so, I mean, you can see it from where you are. So, anyway, I mean, I, I, uh, we all care about families. I mean, families are, uh, and, and that's what Mark said. We don't, we're all on the same page here. All we're talking about is the location. And I feel that, the, as I said, the Youth Center, 42nd Street, offers more flexibility. And I think, uh, you know, we have everything there, including the judges and the courts, something that I, some of us uh, have supported in the past and now have changed into this downtown location, which is puzzling. So anyway, I mean, I appreciate what you say. I agree with it. There are children, uh, but, uh, and we do care about families, uh, Commissioner Kraft. There's no question about that. All, all the people here, the speakers and everybody. But I would like to ask Constance to come down. Uh, yes, would you please come forward? Because you had some comments I'd like. You, you said to me one time, please come forward, will you? Uh, she has something to say about Minneapolis. She lived there. And she told me something I just want her to bring up um, about the young people, uh, how their, uh, our children are treated up there, really, and what, what I think. Uh, if you would step up, Constance, and give your name. Do you mind, Mr. Chair? Constance Myrendorf. OK, now, we talked the other day about what was going on, I think we were at uh, the coffee shop and, and we were talking, we met about this subject. And uh, one of the things that you said about Minneapolis was that uh, there is an off-site place where these young people are taken. And yes. So this is not exactly all Im impact, uh, not, not one downtown location. There are others, aren't there? For, for pre-adjudicated? Would you please uh, uh, give your name? Yes, uh, Constance Myrendorf, uh, Omaha. We were chatting. Oh, I wasn't sure what you were going to ask me. That's, that's, uh, there is a facility west of town in Minnetonka, about 16 to 18 miles west of Minneapolis. I lived up there for 14 years. I'm very much aware of where the detention center is, and uh, it's not in a it's not in an area like our um, our area where, that we're talking about. Um, it's the uh, county home school. And yes, it is post adjudicated. However, um, the, that it's not a, an either or. If our kids are kept here for 30 to 50 days, for whatever reason, uh, we should be doing something with them therapeutically, helping them to develop life skills, helping them to get their credits, with the, which they're doing. They're earning credits all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a great program. Uh, they're doing yoga now, so that's a very important uh, physical and spiritual thing for them. So why is it that we are so concerned about the pre-adjudication um, kids and then we send them to, I don't know, Arizona, we send them to outstate Nebraska, we send them to Iowa, where do we send them and how much money do we spend? Only once they're adjudicated. I mean, we've got them, we need to do something with them pre-adjudication it doesn't matter whether it's downtown or on 42nd Street. I agree with you, 42nd is the best possible um, place for them. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned about not only the kids, first and foremost, because I've read several studies too, and what you're proposing flies in the face of the, um, uh, the Chin study over and over and over again. I've, I've read it very thoroughly. Um, so. We need to take a, a step back, look at 42nd Street as a viable option, not only for the, the courtrooms and the uh, uh, kids, but you know the, the attorneys as well. Lots of options there. Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate that, Constance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, both, both Ramsey and Hennepin counties, when we went up to visit, they both, in addition to their juvenile detention center, which is co-located with their juvenile courts, they do have a treatment center off-site for post-adjudicated kids. Not what we do. We're not in that business. I'm not saying we shouldn't, 
the state is woefully inadequate, obviously, with our judges sending juveniles to the Lincoln Regional Center and, and all these things because there's nowhere else to put them. But it's not the county's responsibility, historically, to take care of kids once they are sentenced. That's the state's responsibility at that point. Please don't confuse what Minneapolis and St. Paul are doing when they assume some of the state's responsibilities up there. Maybe we should be looking at setting up a treatment center, but that's another conversation for another day. That would be in addition to the juvenile detention center, a separate entity with a separate function. Well, let me say this. I, I don't want to, the discussion today is about the, the land. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm fine with bleeding a little bit, but I don't want to go back into the other piece. That, that's been decided. So I'm just saying that to the public. When you have your comments, to try to keep it on the land, I don't. I do not want to have to say. I don't want to be hard with this. If it bleeds a little bit, that's fine because it's kind of there. So, Commissioner Boyle, one last comment. I say that I, I think that uh, the impression is that uh, you know this thing in Minneapolis was this beautiful tower and every, <clears throat> everything was done in this one place. When that's not the case, it, it, we were told that these juveniles are there forever and this is how they're treated and then they're miraculously cured. No, they're not. They're found guilty and they're sent to another spot. There is another location. So I'm just saying we're all on the same page. It's just a question of location. <laughs> just location. We care about families. We care about the children. You know, we need to care about cost. But I'm just saying location is what I'm talking about. It makes much more sense, in my opinion. Okay. Captain, uh, thank you. I don't see anything else. Thank no. you, Captain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? What? Everybody gets called up. I do, you got your hand up? Okay. Yeah, Please stay. My light's been on. I've been waving at you. Go to the light. Good morning. Work. Everybody else gets called up. Because I'm seeing them. If you, the light doesn't work, so okay. I don't look oh, at the light. I, I don't know what I have to do. Well, you got it now. Okay. Well, to the question that you raised relative to um, the land and, and what we're talking about in terms of facilities on 42nd Street or facility downtown, uh, the resolution that we are asked to entertain today uh, in its third whereas says Douglas County also desires to provide the least restrictive and most appropriate setting for juveniles in a community-based, modern, secure, and therapeutic facility um, with close proximity to the community and public services necessary to effectively treat and restore juveniles in Douglas County. Now, whether they're pre-adjudicated or post-adjudicated, I, I appreciate as a lawyer that distinction, um, but what you saw in Minnesota were two facilities that deal with youth, whether they're pre-adjudicated or post-adjudicated, the one that you were shown um, holds them for about seven days as they're processed through a much more expedited adjudication system than we enjoy in Douglas County. Uh, and it would be great if we had one that could dispose of pre-adjudication in seven days. We don't enjoy that. So we have an average stay of rather than seven days, which you saw in the holding facility in downtown Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, a much slower system, uh, which results in 50-day stays. And this apparently captures that idea. You got kids for 50 days, how about some therapy? How about some effective treatment to restore the youth that we are um, responsible for? So I understand you keep using these two phrases um, that are terms of art in the legal profession, pre-adjudication and post-adjudication, I wish you to drill down on that a little bit when you went to Minnesota because you would have found that the seamless treatment of their youth recognizes that they are still youth pre-adjudicated or post-adjudicated is about the programs and the programs that they find up there are most appropriately applied in this more open campus setting of the um, county school far away from downtown um, Minneapolis where they're held for an average of seven days. Um, before whoever comes next, let me say, you, you're, mixing, you're mixing apples, oranges, cherries, berries, and strawberries. Uh, none of that has to 
to do with this in some respect because the discussion along with the builders has been programs. You've had programs presented before you. There's been talk about the programming. So to put that in one deal is a is, is kind of disingenuous in some degree. If you want to talk about the uh, process and all that degree, the, it's never been just about the building. Everybody said it's about everybody involved. So that's the attorneys, the courts, and also the states. And Minnesota uh, and is just as very, is more progressive than us in some degree and has been at this longer. So they should be where they're at to some degree. That's why we visited them to look at their model to get there. So I just want to state that distinction for the point is that you, you've mixed up things that are not even relevant to the point in the system where we're at. So with that, who's ever next, please come forward. Good morning, Kathleen Jim, Jim Rosie, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, with all due respect to all parties involved, I know that we all care about our youth in detention and our families, and many of you on the board have worked on this subject for a very long time and have a ton of experience talking to a lot of people about what is best for our community. I, I really appreciate Mr. Brian Smith's comments and some others that have also taken the time uh, to understand the many different facets of this project. Um, and there's a lot. I mean, there is a whole lot here. Uh, I was at the MUD meeting. After the MUD meeting last week, we did uh, a small group of us went over and toured Douglas County Youth Center. It was not my first visit there, but it was thorough and uh, interesting. And uh, I think that what I heard was a lot of these kids wait 60 to 90 days for any kind of mental health treatment. There is that much lacking in that piece for these guys. And to say that that's a small thing is, I mean, that's a huge part of what we should be looking at. And as you pointed out, it's not the county's responsibility, but the state's. But I think my, when I first heard the plan for having everything together in this beautiful, brand new, shiny package where all of the services, it sounded fantastic. But as I've listened to folks that are in the field and people that have interest in not just uh, the, the tax base that would erode in the Flatiron District, not just the damage for potential for an emerging district that could attract people to downtown Omaha. If you look at Blackstone, if you look at Dundee, if you look at Benson, you know, these are neighborhoods that are built around the his, history of the buildings there. And then, you know, some nice new shiny things are a fine thing. But to take a city block like MUD, and even if we're preserving those buildings, I am still, because I have a restaurant at 17th and Howard, obviously I have a lot of vested interest, but I have a lot of people that work for me that also have a vested interest. I have neighbors who do not want to live between two jails. I have had people in the building that love living in the Flatiron Hotel that say the likelihood of them hanging into the neighborhood if we have a jail to our north and a jail to our south, you know, that neighborhood, it, it really does put kind of a stake in the heart of our emerging little district. So I'm an inarticulate speaker. I never want to get up here because I know that, you know, there's so much I don't know, but I'm trying to understand why we can't take the time to talk about 
why we can't, why it has to be, and I've read it in the paper from different commissioners, that it has to be downtown. The kids have to be downtown. And now it's my understanding that those kids will not have windows in that high rise. Terrible. That's a bad thing. And at DCYC, they do actually have a courtyard in the middle where they, you know, a little bit of money and you could have a nice green space out there for those guys and a lot of room to build and we already own it and there's a whole lot of topics there that a lot of people know that I don't fully understand but not good for the taxpayers possibly because it seems that we wouldn't have enough room for the kids that we would need to house. That's what I heard last week at DCYC. Two, not good for the neighborhood at all bad thing and uh yeah kids neighborhood taxpayers i i just wish that we could take some time and i personally feel like we as taxpayers are being railroaded right now and i thank you for your time thank you thank you, thank you. thank you. Thank you. luis jimenez 518 north 40th street Commissioners, I might have supported the MUD building and block for your youth detention. There is room on the block for a courtyard dedicated to the troubled youth, but I feel I've acquired more knowledge regarding this issue. DLR Chin Court Space Study showed that restricted small site in downtown has a con that future construction is more difficult and expensive. They also say, a review of recently completed juvenile detention facilities nationwide suggests that low-rise or at-grade solutions are preferred in order to maximize views to the outdoors, natural lighting, connection to the nature, uh, the ac and access to outdoor recreation. So this talk about how light comes in through a shaft or what angle is misguided, it really is. Uh, so I, I hope you listen to these words very carefully. A note from the infrastructuralist. If infrastructure cannot adapt, then it should cease. Infrastructure is required to make perpetual adjustments to its form and scale as it traverses ever-changing contexts. It must resist the unchecked urge to rule. If it cannot, then it should cease to act. Neoliberal development and its imperialist Tendencies do not accommodate the diversity of constituents that they entangle. The stakeholders do not solely consist of the investors. The, me the immediate gratification of beneficiaries is short-sighted and without exception results in a collective net loss for future generations of humans and non-humans alike. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Bob Perrin, 1101 South 36th Street. What I would like to do today on this particular subject is talk about the things that can't talk for themselves, and those are the buildings and our history. They're sitting there totally defenseless. It's up to us to recognize them and to take care of them. And the MUD building is pretty easy to see that that's a magnificent structure and should be preserved so we can educate our, our population and our young kids yet to be born. But we also have the garage that's next to the MUD building that should also be preserved. That's a magnificent piece of an old Cadillac garage that's still intact. And when you sit in the flat iron and look out the windows, you see a structure that you don't see anyplace else. You see a point in time and a point in history that speaks loudly to the progress of our community. So we have the automobile sales building that has historic value. We have the MUD building. We have the garage in the MUD building. And we have the flat iron. We have the law building. We have a collection of magnificent buildings. So direct your architects to pay specific attention to the value that's in the property already and what exists, rather than just looking at it from an attitude of nothing has value, let's rip it all down. Because each one of those buildings have an enormous value to us today and to future generations to understand how they got to where they are and what kind of things we pass through. So let's, let's get a committee together to study the historic values of our property and our neighborhood and our districts Let's get some historians, let's get some architects that have expertise in that area, 
have them give you the input of what you really have to work with, no matter what property or what direction you go. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Who else? <clears throat> Larry Store, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, 68132. As I was going through our presentation kit there today, I had to stop and think that, my God, this looks more like a public school board meeting or an IEP meeting than it does a juvenile justice meeting or Douglas County Board meeting. I flipped through there and it talks about IEP plans and education plans and uh, finishing your degree, your high school diploma. Uh, how many graduated? How many were black? How many were white? How many were Asian? My tax dollars paying for all this? Why can't that be done in the school system? Why don't we do it before they get sent out of school, before they get kicked out of the classroom? Can we not tell our teachers and our administrators that this belongs in the schools or in the church or in the family? It doesn't belong at this podium. Our kids are being taken away from us. The Nazis did that. We're going to educate your kids. Your kids belong to us. That's true. Look it up. The state has laws now that will knock on your door and look for that kid that's six months old. We have a learning community council that wants to do that and then wants to send the parents to the parent university because they can't, do, they can't raise their own kids. We have outsiders, progressives that are telling us we know better than you do. And that's got to stop. It's unconstitutional, and it's unfair. And, and Mark, I'd only like to say to you that uh, uh, the families, okay, the families don't always get into it. And again, it's a lot of it has to do with those privacy laws. That, you know, you, uh, if I had a son in high school, I could not request his individual education records according to the privacy laws or the interpretation of that. Maybe it's mostly the interpretation. Many instances where I as a grandparent have been told I'm not entitled to some of that either. Even when I'm there with the parent and with the grandson. No, you're not entitled to that. But if you read IDEA and you read the education laws, the intent of them, that is not the intent. The intent is to get the whole family involved. And I'm sick and tired of professionals and do-gooders saying, oh, well, we know better, and you're not entitled to come, you're not entitled to listen, you're not entitled to offer input. Best practices aren't necessarily best. Put it back where it belongs, starting with the home and the community and the schools. It doesn't belong here. Thank you. Anyone else? My name's Tyler Wilson. <clears throat> I'm a resident of Omaha. Um, so there's, there's one thing that's a common factor in both the MUD property and the OHA.com building property. Both of them have historic buildings. Both of them have historic buildings that need to be preserved. And the MUD building, there's that nice, wonderful clause that says you can't tear down the building, you can't do anything to the building, to the exterior, for 50 years, which is fantastic, and I'm so glad that MUD put that in there. But we talk about how families are the most important thing, and that is so true, but yet the actions of this board don't reflect that. The fact that I haven't seen a single family, mom, dad, child, who has come to this board meeting and said, my child was in the Douglas County Youth Center. This was our experience. This is our opinion. This is what should be done. This is what shouldn't be done. It hasn't happened. 
part of that is because you hold these meetings at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday when 90% of people are at work and can't make it. But we need to look at what is best for kids, what's best for their families, and how can we do that if we don't get input from them? How come we haven't gone to them and invited them here and made it convenient for them to come here to give that opinion. Um, I was with Kathleen on that tour of the youth center, and I'd like to thank Mr. Alexander and Mr. LaFleur for letting us come in and letting us see the operations that are going on there and letting us take a good close look at what is going to be changed for the next 100 years. And Mr. Alexander is doing great things in the youth center, and no one denies that. I think that we need to take a look at these programs that we've been talking about, that these programs are going to drop the number, these programs are going to do this, these programs are going to do that. Great. Let's do the programs now. Let's implement those programs. Let's wait a year and make sure they work. Let's make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to. And then let's visit building a building. Because from what I can see, the youth center, yeah, it could use you know, some new tile and some new paint and, you know, maybe replace the plexiglass that's scratched up. But it works for now. So let's put the programs into place. Let's fix the problems and then focus on the building. That's what makes the most sense. Whether you put it on the MUD lot, whether you put it on the dot-com lot, that's fine, but make sure it's truly what is needed and what's best for Douglas County. We have an existing building. The one thing that I'm curious about is in Minneapolis, did they have a fully functioning youth center that was well under capacity, that had room for growth, that had room for expansion before they built their new facility? Did they have that? They were shrinking in size. Their numbers were going down. Okay, so their numbers were going down. Our numbers, as far as I can tell, haven't gone down for the last five to six years. Then look at the statistics from five or six years ago before you make that statement, please. I thought we weren't supposed to engage in dialogue back and forth. This is on the agenda. Good. Well, you should not ask that. Come on, finish. So, our numbers are dropping, yes, but they've been stagnant for the last couple of years. And now you're telling me that you're going to drop them by almost half, but there's nothing to prove that that's going to happen. What's, what's there to prove that? So Tyler, let me tell you, I've heard this twice. This, you know what's there to prove it? LB 1112, which goes into LB 670, that says kids can no longer be detained next year because of harm to self or because they can't find a placement. If you look at the numbers and things that have been said here today, and, that, and this has been said by people that are in there, probably a third, which is probably somewhere between 20 and 25 kids, have done a heinous offense. All the other ones are sitting there waiting for placement and some other things. So the law says next year at this time they're not going to be able to be there. So we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And that doesn't mean we can't do a building and do the programs. If the building is to happen, it'll be three years. We'll have time. So. To your answer to your question, the law says next year probably a, a good amount of kids in there will not be able to detain. They have to find a service. So you had 30 seconds before I committed, so I'm going to let you finish because I interrupted you. So you said the law states that it will probably go down. Do a, I, no, do a study. The, no, 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 do no, no, no. Listen, I didn't say the law says anything. I told you what the law says will happen next year. And if you use... Um, logical thought, then you know what's there. So I'm going to let you finish your closing statement and, and deal from there. Okay. Do a study. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to do that. Are you, can I finish now? Yes. Okay. Do a study. This isn't going to take place in three years. Do a study that's going to show me that the number is going to drop from 70 kids to this many kids. Show me factual, proven statistics that show the exact number that that law is going to drop those kids down to. Because you thank don't you. have it. All right, thank you. You, you thank don't you. have it. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Who's next? 
Anyone next? I do. Oh, you want to? Pete? Okay. Hi, my name's Paul Bellinger. I'm at 10215 West Center Road. I wonder if my commissioner would yield to a question. Is James T. Gleason going to be running this? Is he going to be over that? I thought I heard that at one point in time. Somebody state that. Running what? I'm sorry. The juvenile justice system when it's completed. Or is I'm he aware of that? You're not aware of that. The justice that was up in 903 that is running the system now, he departed from this building. Is that correct, Commissioner? He said that that wasn't what he wanted. He didn't see that as being the system that was inclusive in his plans. Yeah, I think you might be referring to Judge McDermott. Is that correct? In, in 903 up there, you right, had him. Right. He's a retired uh, district court judge who, who had juvenile court authority in his jurisdiction as well. Yes, and he, he his opinion was it would be better at 42nd Street than in a... In a correct. Uh, That's what I thought I heard as well. So do we do a disservice then, Commissioner, to our, to our community when we don't, when, when, when we have people that dangle the carrot out in front with the money to put the 501c3 name on the building versus having the people that are going to run the system like James T. Gleason or whatever judge we have there, do we do a disservice in the long run to our community when we don't allow those people the upward mobility of doing great things in our community, fashioning these programs, fashioning these buildings to our community. Do we do a disservice to our community? I mean, I was, I was just shocked that we kind of went on after that in that meeting. I mean, we got an answer from him that this wasn't the building that we wanted and that this didn't really kind of fit the scheme of our children and what we wanted. In the long run, doesn't it make more sense for us to put the judge's name that's running the building on the side of the building rather than to have it called the High V Juvenile Justice County System or well, or whatever we're going to put on? I'm not, I'm not saying it, 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 it's going to be that, and I mean no dis, disrespect to Claire or, or to you or, or any of you. I'm, I'm asking because I was one of those kids that was off the rails. I was one of those ki kids that had many many programs placed on me, you know, but I gave Mary Ann Borgeson a picture and, and, you know, I was able to, I was able to, I was able to crawl underneath that fence and that picture right there, you know, that's my mom, the amazing aviatrist that she was, you know, she put me through some programs that nobody wants to see, the programs that you guys haven't even calculated yet, but May, uh, Commissioner Boyle, do we do a disservice? I mean, back in the old days when we used to, we used to build buildings and we used to put people's names on the side that meant something. Isn't that really we we speak for our community going forward? We we place the name on the side of the building so these people will do great things and save our community a whole bunch of money. That's upward mobility. I mean, in your firm, you like to see upward mobility. You you reward those people. My judge is the same way. When he's elected to office, he writes a lot of stuff, but his upward mobility really is when he does a great job and he stands before our community and our community says, wow, this guy really needs to, he, he needs a place in history. And I wonder if we cir are circumventing that process with the dangling carrot of the 501c3 prior and paying twice as much for it, Commissioner, like your study shows. Am I off the rails here still, or do I need another program? Do well, I, I need it, a program? <laughs> I, huh? think, I think you bring up a couple of good points, and so let me just uh, point, point out a couple things. Um, uh, you're right about the, you know, the uh, judge's opinion relative to we could do better on 42nd Street refurbishing the youth center than we could building a, a cell block downtown for all the reasons that the Chin Report and other best practices show. Um, the uh, idea that we're kind of rushing through something that, you know, we're sure. really hurrying towards failure here is one that keeps coming up again and again and again. There's no rush. We need to do this right, not quickly. Right. And most recently, the Douglas County Juvenile Services Comprehensive Community Plan for July 1, 2018, July 30th, 2021, makes no mention of this facility. 
that's the comprehensive strategic right. plan of Douglas County uh, that our esteemed chairman uh, oversaw. Not a mention, not a mention. Uh, so why don't we have that discussion about yeah. these things? We've hold, held these hearings, and you obviously have attended some, that dealt with stakeholder after stakeholder from the legal profession, the county attorney and public defender, to the judiciary, to the service providers, to the involved parents. And they, they, they have been at, at these uh, meetings and, and involved youth uh, about what is, what is, in your idea, the best solution. Right. Those things need to be ongoing and incorporated into a real strategic plan for what we do. Finally, we've already acquired property at great expense to right. the taxpayers of Douglas County. Right. What's going to happen to that property? There's no space study on what happens to the OHA building that we bought for $2.75 million. What happens to the IT building? Uh, there's no space study that has been completed by the building commission to address any of those things. And finally, we have before us a resolution to spend $6 million, no mention of where that's going to come from, uh, next week, no public hearings beyond what you're having here today, um, for a property uh, that there is no appraisal on. Um, I don't know too many people who go ahead, myself included, uh, buying commercial property without appraising the whole thing. As a matter of fact, we did appraise the non- uh, headquarters portion of this when the county made an unsuccessful bid on uh, this property earlier this year. It specifically says it's the land only, not the buildings on the land. And so, you know, we don't even have a good idea of what this thing would be appraised for because we're in a rush to do the bidding of this private corporation that you uh, referred to. There was a meeting yesterday, supposedly a public meeting. Of course, they're not subject to public records or public meeting laws, so they didn't do a couple of things. They had three big no-bid contracts totaling $15 million or so, um, but those contracts were not available until the day of the meeting because they don't have to make them available. And so now they're going to have a, a week layover so that anybody who wants to delve through hundreds of pages of contract language, spend $15 million worth of our yeah. money to yeah. a private corporation, can take time out of their day and do that, and then they'll rubber stamp them next week. People on this board and people on our staff serve as officers of that uh, private corporation. Uh, people that volunteered to do it and people that were drafted to do it serve both as Douglas County employees and commissioners and as officers and members of a private corporation that's going to do business to the tune of $15 million for itself on no-bid contracts. All of that is yet to be discussed in public. It might take a little time, but we have all the time in the world to do this. We need to do this right, not quick, and you raise some great points. Finally, I've met with some of the prospective private donors, and they are reluctant, would be a, a charitable word, to put their name on a kid's cell block in downtown yeah. Omaha. Yeah. And uh, I think that... that well, I was being facetious with the high well, you, you, You're too, absolutely but, right, though. But... but um, it, let, no, I mean, you had your five minutes, but thank you. But let me let me state thank you, two President. points before I go to Commissioner Morgan, or three points. Um, your last statement is absolutely wrong. I know it's wrong about the uh, philanthropic community. Uh, and you know it's wrong. And so the other piece is you stated the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan is required by the state not to build a building for programs. And you talk out of both sides of your mouth when you say we don't have programs. And we're just talking about builders when the plan you just mentioned is done every three years to fund programs. So I just want to clarify that for the public is that that's what that's there for. In, in some degree. And lastly, I don't speak for the judge that spoke at your meeting. The one meeting I did come to, um, I heard that judge. That judge did not specify a specific place. That judge definitely did not call it a cell block. And that judge said he advocated for it to be in one place, and that was, that was true. Commissioner Morgan. Okay. Thank you. A couple things. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh, 
yesterday when those three contracts were presented because they got there late before the committee, we had not seen him. I made the motion that we laid it over. And that's the end of it. We had not read him, so it didn't happen. None of us had it before or saw it or talked about it. So it was laid over, just so you know. That's what was done. The second thing is you mentioned appraisals, that no one buys commercial property without appraisals. I'll give you some information. In the last uh, 60 days, there's been more than 30-some million dollars worth of property sold in downtown Omaha and 144th. And I'm not talking about the Boys Town property. I'm talking about to the north of the Boys Town property that were purchased in different situations without appraisals. The people look at the market and they make the purchase of those properties. So when you made the comment that people don't buy any commercial property without appraisals, that's not true. They buy them all the time without appraisals. Uh, they might go to the bank, and the bank may get an appraisal once they go to get financing. However, uh, those two properties were bought, or three properties, without appraisals, and, and they did not uh, ever get appraisals even from the bank. Also, Tyler mentioned, uh, you know, about meeting at night. When I came here, Commissioner Borgeson will remember this and others, that I asked and requested that we have night meetings, and we did. And I wanted those because I thought it would help to get more people to attend our meetings. And luckily, uh, the commissioners felt sorry for me and decided to let me try it. Commissioner Duda knows it too. I, I think that was a first. The attendance was really somewhat disastrous of those meetings. Commissioner Boyle was there. Uh, so we did try that for a while to see if that would do it on a monthly basis and help us. The other thing that was mentioned is that we haven't been transparent. I believe, and I'm going to yield to the chairman, who uh, does a great, difficult job. Um, if someone comes to the microphone while we're discussing an item on the agenda, they can ask a specific commissioner a question if they want. Am I accurate on that? And I know that Tyler said this morning that uh, he's been coming here six months, and I respect that. Um, so we have been trying to have discussions and we can put things on the agenda, as you've done today, to discuss this. And I think all of us are in agreement, because I think I've read it correctly, and I stand to be corrected by one of the commissioners, that we need to build the largest portion of this without question downtown with the courts, with the county attorney, and so on. So no matter what, there's that need, and that need has to be pretty much adjacent to this courthouse in this facility. And, you know, I'm appreciative that MUD is considering working with us. That was our first option that we talked about for some time. It's come back around, and I think it makes good sense to do it. I also want to correct one other thing. We put in, we this board, and I would not support it if they were going to take down that tremendous building that they have on the corner. And I put in that covenant, all of us did, that we wanted to preserve that building for 50 years. And Teresa Yurick, who does an outstanding job of keeping us in line, uh, she has that language in there. So it wasn't put in by MUD, but I know they're appreciative of that and wanted that also, but we put that language in. So we're trying to do the right thing, and uh, we'll continue, I know, to have more discussions. So that's all I have to say about it. 
one uh, last thing, I'm sorry. We have had parents come before this board in the last six months and also some people that have been held in detention have come before this board and spoke about it. So it is, when the statement was made that none of the parents have come down here, that we've had that. So I think there is some misinformation that comes up. Commissioner Duda. Um, let me go on hold for a minute, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Kraft. Yes, we apparently have strayed from the question. The question is, do we want to make a bid to the MUD um, board mm -hmm. for the purchase of the property? We know we need the property for a courthouse. The rest of this is a different discussion. So they have talked to us about buying the whole property. We originally were going to try to buy three quarters of the property. We have in the agreement, we're going to, if it goes as I ex expect it to, agreements that the building will pre be preserved for at least 50 years, except for an act of God. Uh, uh, somebody brought up the, the issue of uh, receiving documents the day of the meeting that are hundreds of pages long. We receive documents here on the day of the meeting many times, right here. And we don't have time to read it, and it's time sensitive. So that abides by the open meeting law because we can discuss it. So. Yeah, I, I'm tired of people spreading misinformation and disinformation that gets printed or televised. There is so much misinformation that is being spread at this time. I'm not going to call it fake news. It's misinformation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, May I? Uh, sure. There's no motion. It's only for discussion. Oh, that's right. yeah. Only for discussion. Uh, Commissioner Duda, yeah. are, you, are you done? Commissioner? Well, there, I could talk for over 45 minutes with the notes I took. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to off the subject like some of the public and some of the commissioners have, but I'm not going to. If, if I may follow, you thank might. you for the, the segue because you're exactly right. We are going off topic here. We're focused on are we going to build a new juvenile detention center downtown? Doesn't matter. Does not matter to this discussion. I hear seven commissioners saying we need to expand the courthouse. I think we all are in agreement with that. The question becomes then, do you include the juvenile detention center or not with it? Let me set that question aside for another day because regardless, we should be making the offer on this MUD property. We only have two spots to pick from if we're going to expand the courthouse. It has to be next to the courthouse for, for security and efficiency's sake. There's only two blocks to pick from. If indeed we are dead set against eminent domain and using it for Mr. Perrin's building, then I don't see how you can not support putting in a bid for the MUD property. But I maintain that we want the whole block, whichever block we go with, or as much of it as we can get, recognizing they each have an historic building, uh, that, that we would have to work around, but what, even without the juvenile detention center, I mean, Commissioner Kavanaugh has called for somewhere between a four and 12 story courthouse annex, but everybody's calling for a courthouse annex. We all recognize that need. Why don't we focus on that and say, which is the better block? Uh, that's, to me, that's what this whole conversation should be about. And yes, we, the dot-com building we've owned for a long time and will continue owning it for a long time. The OHA building, yes, we bought. I am now starting to recognize that there is value to owning some of the property around your courthouse because if somebody else puts up a building first, they're going to say, oh, no, 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 you can't go there. The courthouse was here first. We were here since before Nebraska was a state. This is the third courthouse on this site. And, and I really kind of resent people saying, not in my backyard, don't put a courthouse here. Uh, courthouse is here. It's going to stay here. We're going to add on to it. We need to add on to it next door. This is the better site of the two we have to pick from. That should be the focus of the discussion. Thank you.
Commissioner Boyle. Boyle. <laughs> well, engrave this on the wall. Uh, I agree completely <laughs> with Commissioner Duda. Uh, we do need to focus. The thing that we agree on, and, I, and some time ago, when I got appointed finally to the Douglas County Building Commission, I pushed for it for years, um, and Commissioner Borgerson was chair, I said, uh, let's, we got to do something about the courthouse. And this all got started, and somehow the juvenile center got attached. Uh, we need to <clears throat> agree, I think we all do, I know we do, that we have to do something with the courthouse, the judges, the courtrooms, the whole thing, because and public defender and county attorney and all of that. We need to do this, and the ideal site that was originally suggested was the MUD site, and it was going along pretty well. Yes. The problem in all of this has been, even with some of the sellers, I mean, you know, the Federal Reserve, we went up there, the Building Commission went to the Federal Reserve and said, we'd like to rent some space, that's wonderful and everything else, then everything's going along fine, and suddenly someone says, oh, who's coming? You know, the assessor? Mm, no, juvenile court. Uh, maybe this lease won't work. So we couldn't go. It was a classic, not in my backyard. And that's been a, a theme, undercurrent, in almost everything that I've observed, and I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but that's kind of what I hear. Let's decide on something that really doesn't have any opposition, and that is the courthouse, as you said, Commissioner Duda. I think we ought to decide on the perfect site, which is MUD. And then if uh, I am opposed to adding a juvenile justice center to it, uh, I, I really agree with the neighbors. I had a, a conversion, uh, kind of like St. Paul, I had a conversion on the road at uh, the Flatiron, beautiful Flatiron restaurant, and uh, listen to the taxpayers. And I've changed my position back to really where I was a long time ago, along with Commissioner Borgen, Borgerson, but she hasn't switched back yet. We'll work on her. But I think we ought to agree on building the courthouse and then uh, and get, it, and get on with this discussion about the Juvenile Justice Center. I think you're absolutely right. Um, so that's where I am. So thank you. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thanks. Well, um, I, I think that we do have a big ground for agreement on the courthouse expansion. I think that, you know, there's probably unanimous agreement on that. Uh, where we fall apart is on the uh, removal of the Douglas County Youth Center from the campus that we own at 42nd Street and the creation of a cell block downtown. Can you stop calling it a cell block? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Stop building a cell block and I'll stop calling it one. But uh, the, the idea that we have the MUD property in our sites again now, you know, begs a couple questions. And, and I'm glad that we're having this discussion because when you go forward on $6 million real estate purchases, you should probably talk about it. Uh, and the first question is, how come this site, how come this amount? Uh, and we really haven't had that discussion, but uh, the idea that it's adjacent to the courthouse is, you know, something that I have advocated that we should be interested in the periphery around our campus here. Uh, the uh, proposals that have been put forward uh, by the Administrative Services Committee and by others in the public or private sector uh, revolve around different alternatives to what has been proposed by HDR and the private corporation. And the question then becomes, well, what is this for? Because we buy a city block, we don't have a plan for that block. We've spent millions already on a plan for uh, the footprint on 18th Street from the OHA building that we paid $2.75 million for, the IT building, and then the parent building uh, that's subject to our uh, eminent domain, which I oppose. So what is this for? What does it look like? I mean, we have spent lots of time, and many people in the public at their own expense have spent lots of time putting forward very professionally done alternatives, and now we have a new proposal, but there's no plan, there's no uh, site plan, there's no drawings, there's no nothing from the architects and engineers that were uh, employed by the private corporation at our expense for what goes up there, whether it's four stories or 12 stories or what is the uh, MUD headquarters used for, what is the OHA building that we bought and paid for uh, going to be used for. None of this is discussed, none of it's planned out, uh, there is no plan. 
and that's not a way to go forward on major uh, real estate acquisitions or major construction projects. We don't have an appraisal, and um, Commissioner Morgan says that's no big thing. Well, Commissioner Morgan's in the real estate business, and I respect his expertise uh, in that, but it doesn't give me a comfort level uh, that somebody else can proceed in the private sector using their private money uh, without an appraisal. And he rightfully points out, certainly by the time you get around to talking to the bank about a mortgage, they're going to want an appraisal. And so we should use the same due diligence that at least banks do relative to their money for our public money. And we should have appraisals on acquisitions that we use public dollars for. Um, the OHA building is a, a good example of what happens when you don't, because we paid too much for that building by almost everybody's estimation except OHA. And the only people that benefited by that were OHA and the realtors that handled that transaction. The Building Commission has a space study commissioned, and they have not commenced that space study. At the end of the day, this is going to be Building Commission campus expansion, and it would make sense to have that space study completed before acquisition and construction of new buildings on that campus um, took place. We don't know if we abandon the OHA building, what goes in there. Nothing's been presented to us on that. We don't know if we uh, have dot-com stay where they are or go someplace else. We don't even know internally when and where the public defender, the county attorney, the courts, and the probation uh, move or don't move, and what goes into those spaces. None of this has been planned out. Um, we need to slow down let the space study occur, get an appraisal, see if we're competitive with what the market is, let the process of our committees, like we did on the public safety bond issue, hold hearings of uh, uh, all of the interested parties on all of the uh, levels that I'm talking about, from programs to construction to uh, real estate acquisition to uh, uh, space studies and then come back with a completed comprehensive plan that actually encompasses everything that we're talking about. Uh, we have the time to do it. Uh, it doesn't cost us anything more. That's what we're supposed to do as your government. But if we hurry up, putting the cart in front of the horse again, acquiring property before we have a plan for its use again, we'll end up like we just are about to on the OHA property. Spending $2.75 million on a property that now we're not going to use. Finally, what about the eminent domain? <laughs> Do we hereby abandon the eminent domain? I'm all for doing that, and I think that that would be a good thing. But what about the eminent domain? We're talking about spending $6 million on the next block over to acquire a bunch of property, and yet, what, continuing the eminent domain against the uh, property uh, across the street? So if we're going to do this resolution, I, I would make a couple of amendments. One of them is that it doesn't automatically include property for a cell block downtown. And secondly, that it does include automatically uh, a, an abandonment of the eminent domain uh, suit that is currently in the courts and at our request, Douglas County's request, has been continued now. I don't know if we have a date certain for... Uh, the continuation. At our request, it's been continued now, and presumably that was done to facilitate this MUD discussion. So this is a case of first impression for all of you out there in viewing land and all of you public uh, uh, individuals and taxpayers. This hasn't been on our agenda before, but it's set to be approved in one week's time. That's, that's the contempt that the, the, the process shows for planning, strategic planning, and it answers none of these questions. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing that we acquire the periphery properties for expansion, as, as Commissioner Boyle pointed out. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that we expand for uh, judicial uh, capacity on the juvenile court 
that's not a bad thing either. I think we have broad agreement that we need to do those things. But how we do it, and are we doing it in the most efficient, cost-effective, smart way, is really under question here. Because again and again, we put uh, backroom deals on the top of the agenda and, and hurry up for decisions on multi-million dollar projects uh, and give them to a private corporation that they did uh, continue the multi-million dollar contract discussion for a week because they, they had heard that people were starting to ask questions. But that's a week, and they didn't have to. They're not subject to these statutes. They just do this as a noblesse oblige. We'll do you a favor and continue it for one week. Good luck reading through the hundreds of pages of contracts that their lawyers spent months compiling. But they didn't have it done in time to give them any more than 24 hours notice uh, yesterday. So for all of these reasons, I think that we should slow down. We've got plenty of time to make this offer in the new year after we've answered some of these questions. And the only reason to make it quick is to satisfy the interests of this real estate deal, which will then satisfy the interests of this construction deal, which is being run by a private corporation. Commissioner Kraft. Yes, and I just want to point out that the World Herald wrote a wonderful editorial yesterday. And um, it, it explains a lot of the things, and it portrays it in a totally different manner than has been portrayed by some people here. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to uh, move and discuss the uh, resolution that's before us. and. Uh, Commissioner Duda did help frame it, uh, did frame it, and I think the others have said the same thing. What I would like to propose is that on this resolution, we, re we uh, uh, change the second whereas, if you can get that in front of you, uh, where it presently says, whereas Douglas County desires to expand the Douglas County Hall of Justice to relieve space constraints with respect to Douglas County agencies and departments involved in the justice system. That's okay. And then a semicolon and an and should be in place. And the language I'd like to see removed because we don't agree on it. Well, and Mike, I'm actually, this is just me? for discussion today. I'm sorry? Gonna, it's just for discussion today. If you're I know do it, it is, but I'm saying if we could get this done for the, so that we can consider oh. it, I'd like to see that last, last, the rest of it removed, talking about a, a juvenile justice uh, uh, center in that building. And then the next thing I would like to delete the third whereas completely. And then I had a question that I did ask legal counsel about. It's a little, seems to me a little awkward. The very last, be it also resolved, uh, it's got um, the director of Douglas County Public Properties, Douglas County Chief Administrative Officer, Douglas County Deputy County Administrator, and Douglas County Budget and Finance Director are each authorized to sign the final purchase agreement so long as the purchase price described above is the same or substantially the same as what is represented in this resolution. I just, I kind of, I don't know, it seems kind of awkward. I, I think. I thought what we do is have the chair sign these agreements, but uh, if uh, if you're available, if not the vice chair, I mean, I just wonder. This seems kind of strange, but maybe it's not. I, maybe I've missed it in the past. But that's what I'd like to suggest that when we do the resolution, because we agree on, we can all, you know, we can come back, and there is a majority that probably supports that. But we need discussion. I heard a few people saying things today that were uh, sounds like they really may be open to where this is located, and. I think we need to discuss it further. So that's what I'd propose. I'd like to see that done. Would someone prepare that? I guess uh, Patrick, maybe you're the person. Or let me say, let me say, Mike. I, Pardon if me? you want, no, I say if you want to make that amendment next week, that's fine. I would, but I just want to have it prepared. Okay, and, but and no, I'm gonna tell you. I, I think the board's already spoken on that. The well, board, you, that's your opinion. Your no, vote, that's not my opinion. That's two, three votes. Okay, you're no, gonna be, the, the votes. The board's listen. vote is five, two to do that. No, let, let are, me finish. Let me no, finish. Let no, me finish. no, no, Patrick, no. I want you to prepare let the resolution. Me finish. Mike, I'll you're out of order. No, I'm not. Out of yes, order. you are out of order. Listen, you are so not I'm the asking king you to. Kings. I listen to you. I'm asking you to listen you to me. You are not the king of kings. I am not, but I am in. But I am facilitating the process. So please, I let you finish. Let me finish. I'm answering your question. You didn't let me finish. I did. No, you didn't. I'm going to I'm going to state what I'm going to you. No, you I am not. Me you go through this every time and no, I'm I respectful don't. to you. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Listen, hey, listen. Well, let me let, let me, finish. me finish. No, I did. I did. You did. I'm I not finished. finished. Okay, I'll give it back to you after I'm finished. You whiz. This is be ridiculous. If you want to make your amendment next week, I you're will. free to do it. I just told him to write it. No, but I'm That's telling you the let board has spoken to this 3 
four, five times. Chris, this is nuts. Five, two. So if you want to make your amendment next week, that's fine. But the board has spoken his will on co-location. I don't think you've heard what Commissioner Duda said today and others. I, I heard so what Commissioner off. Duda said. Just back off and let the board operate. You are not is the there, king of kings. Is there anyone else from the public that wants to speak? But you're still Please my do. friend. That's good to know. Good morning. I'm Norma LeClaire from Bellevue, Nebraska. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you for the jobs that you do week in and week out. You couldn't pay me enough to do it. This is the first time that I have ever become so involved in a public issue. And I thank all of you for the education, good and bad. My original involvement began five months ago to save Bob Perrin's historic building from being demolished by eminent domain. So it worked for five months anyway. I'm still involved in that. Now I'm involved with speaking on behalf of the Juvenile Detention Center and the young people there and all of those involved in the programs there with them. I toured the Juvenile Detention Center last week and I'm here to tell you that the current facility is clean and bright and everyone there is doing a terrific job. We should be very proud of the jobs that they do. I can't remember reading or hearing about their national award in 2016. They could easily use some updates. However, they have plenty of space for those updates. They can enlarge their crowded facility and their library specifically. It could be about four times the size it is now. It's doing good things, and they found that the children coming there a lot of times, they get into problems because they can't even read, and they're very frustrated, and their homes are a disaster many times. I'm speaking off my paper now. They could use a lot more computer space. They only have access to these two computer rooms for two hours a week. And in this day and age, even this old lady is on the computer more than four hours a week. <clears throat> the mental health counseling area needs to be tripled in size. Their family visitation area is used for graduation also. It's probably the most pleasant place in there, but it could be more pleasant and more encouraging for the parents when they do come to visit. But the big thing is the current location has plenty of room for all of these improvements. With the 144 beds that are not in use, they have the room for the 70 beds that they have used for the past six years, plus they have that overflow available as our city grows. And I've gone to several town hall meetings, and it doesn't sound like Omaha's getting smaller. So we're going to be faced with more young people probably in trouble. <clears throat> so believe me, when you address some of these issues, you will have other cities coming to see our facility on 42nd Street. The programs in place now are very impressive, and the big plus is space. These other cities are restricted because of space limitation. Thank you. And please still think about the Civic Auditorium for the judges. Maybe you could do a tunnel under the city, and it could be heated, and they could get on a Segway and be there in a hurry. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? On this item? On this Tim item? Thompson, 1001 South 35th Avenue. On this item? Huh? On this item? On this item. Oh, okay. I've been sitting there patiently. I want to get over it quick to get the other items. Okay. But I have to say something. Buy the building. MUD wants to sell it. Willing buyer, willing seller. Work out the money. I trust P.J. Morgan. The space, if you got excess space, get deeds back here, get the treasurer back here. So as a consumer of the services of the county services, I want to come here. Midtown growing, downtown growing population. It's a nice problem to have the excess space. Release 
Bob Pierre from the eminent domain, you satisfy a lot of people, let them and Jim Rosie build that neighborhood, which I would, I'd be watching them because it's a, it's a nice spot to do. So real quickly, move on this particular, I'm not gonna talk about juvenile justice. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice compliment, I appreciate that. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I'm Nicole LeClaire. I live in Bellevue, Nebraska, and I too have been coming to these meetings since um, five months ago, and uh, I've learned more than I ever wanted to learn <laughs> coming. Um, and I'd really like not to come because I've got a lot of other things I need to do in my life, but I also feel like this is so important. Um, and I could nitpick over what you said, what you said, what you said, um, but I don't think that's going to help the situation right now. Um, and in the, in the spirit of the holiday season, you know, I really hope that we can just look at what we agree on, you know, and that we all are humans and we all have feelings and needs and the kids have needs. And I too went to the MEG meeting and I always love going to other meetings um, because they listen. And I will say today, I, I, and at other meetings here, I've observed you all talking amongst each other when citizens are up here talking. I appreciate you're not doing it now, um, but being rather distracted and, and when other commissioners are talking that you may not agree with. And I, I just think it would be lovely if we could just have some civility in this whole process. And I know we're not gonna all agree on everything, but if we can look to what we do agree on, and I think all of my friends here, we do agree that the courthouse needs to be expanded. It's just a matter of where. And um, I think we all agree that we care about children. And it's not just the future of Omaha through buildings that's important in our history, but it's really, I also um, started the tour, I didn't quite complete it at the Juvenile Justice Center last week as well, but I was able to sit and listen for about an hour to Brad and Mr. LaFleur. So, um, yeah, I just think if we can just come together and look at what we have in common and see how we can how we can make this work um, with respect to the kids. So I lost track of my thoughts. Thank you so much. I'd love to not see you regularly. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'd love to see us not regularly. I will also say what was a treat last week at the MEG meeting as they came up to us afterwards and they thanked us personally. They put hands on our back, which didn't bother me. They put hands on our back and said, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your ideas and your thinking. And that's really what you know, your public is asking of you all, that your public voted you in. We want you to just listen to us. Thank you so much. I had your eye contact. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? With that, Commissioner Borks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know I have sat um, quietly today because, again, there's a lot that could be said um, and stuff that has be said that has been said that I could react to. But I want to reiterate my three goals of this whole project have to do with um, what's best for our kids and our families. My three goals for um, right sizing our youth center and providing what we need for our youth and our families deals with prevention, intervention, and aftercare. I also have a vision that if we do this right and we are able to keep our children and our families intact and out of the system, we can intervene quickly if they are in the system and get them out to the services and programs that they need. Or, and once they get out, that we have the programs and services in place to keep them from um, coming back into the system, we too could have a treatment facility which is totally different than what has been stated here today, like Minneapolis has at our current location. We can look, as Commissioner Boyle said, at what is needed in the mental health arena for our treatments, the treatments that our kids and our families need in that, um, with those issues. So um, I, I think it's, again, we can disagree 
and we can disagree respectfully and I appreciate your civility comment because I always enjoy and I can't remember the constituents name there that just spoke but um, I always enjoy listening to you because you always speak with a smile um, and so thank you um, because again we can disagree but we can disagree respectfully we can be civil to one another and still moves forward. But this throwing out derogatory terms, misinformation, twisting facts has got to stop so that even if you are on the other side, you know exactly what we're talking about. And so I don't mind you coming to our board. I don't mind hearing from you. But what I do want to start hearing is solutions to the programs and services that are needed. I have attended meetings with parents. Parents not only have been here, but I have attended meetings and continue to attend those that parents, for, with parents who want to talk about what programs and services are needed. And so again, you can be a naysayer, that's fine, but do it respectfully. If you want to try to be a part of the solution, then provide me some input on that so that I can look at those services and programs that could, again, prevent kids and families from coming into our system, intervening in a timely manner to get them out of our system quickly, and then once they're out, make sure that they don't come back and that we are providing them what they need. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. Well, <clears throat> Commissioner Borger said you hit the nail on the head as well today, just recent, just now. And I, <clears throat> I would make a suggestion uh, respectfully that one of the ways that we can uh, do away with some of the misconceptions and some of the uh, exaggerations or whatever is taking place, because there are some and uh, comments being made, is that we, we should hold probably at least six, maybe ten town halls around the county and uh, go out in the evening and uh, UNO and other places and, and I'll get a full tank of gas and come out into your district and uh, uh, we'll stop and eat on the way. And um, anyway, uh, hold these meetings out uh, and I think we need to do that. I, and uh, I'd like to see us uh, commit to that. I think it would stop some of these, uh, the comments. And many of us have met, you're exactly right, uh, talking with the people who have been incarcerated. Uh, there was a woman here last week, uh, surprised to find out uh, who her family is. They're a, a very active family in the community. and um, But she talked about her, her son. I think there's a lot to learn from them, and I really do. So a series of town hall meetings that we're comfortable with and talking about these uh, options and what they are, uh, I think would be very helpful, and I hope that can happen. And the other thing I'd like to do, <clears throat> when I was on that committee that we met with uh, the group, when the uh, 501c3 came up, I said it needs to be public. Uh, we need to, it needs to have a public record. It needs to follow. I th it's my opinion <clears throat> that whenever we have anything uh, associated with the county board, that they have to comply with the open meetings law and the public records law, that they don't have the option of saying we're not doing that. <clears throat> and so the documents have to be available and so forth. And yesterday we discussed this about having moving the, uh, uh, this uh, nonprofit board meeting to this forum on a Tuesday morning and having them uh, be here first because they, as someone pointed out, they're expensive lawyers who were paying by the hour to talk. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, have them come in uh, when they want to have their meeting right here, which will be on Cox Communication with us. We can sit in the audience and listen to it, and the public can be here as well, and then we go into a county board meeting. I'd really like to see us do that. I think we have to. Because as we talked about it yesterday, uh, while we, some of us think that we have been completely transparent, and I know that we've worked at it, but the perception is we're not. And perception rules. So I think we need to try to accommodate and, and, and step up to the plate and say, yeah, that happened. Here's how we remedy it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, before we move to the next item, let me note. Um, we've had discussion on this today. and. Our plans, my, the plans are to have limited discussion next week, limited, because we discussed it today. And I just want that to be known to the public. Sure. We'll I'll take a five-minute recess and reconvene.
you all going to be up next when we come back. So, Brett, you all going to be up next when we come. Yeah, I'm glad you said it. <laughs> because I didn't know who it was. <laughs>
Okay, if you all ready, we're going to pull it back together. Please. I know. It looks like we're not going to make this luncheon, but. <laughs> we're going to proceed. Uh, to the Child and Youth Services Committee. Um, item one is just a note of the minutes for the record. And uh, item one is the Douglas County Youth Center report from uh, the Superintendent Brad Alexander. Brad. Good morning, uh, Commissioners. Brad Alexander, the Superintendent of the Douglas County Youth Center. Um, so I have handed out the the presentation. You should have it in front of you. Um, it'll also be up on the screen, but. Uh, we won't hit all of the slides on the presentation, so um, if we could start, please, it's at uh, page number three. And I'll present this information, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Greg Hepburn. He's got some information regarding expediting that he's going to share with you as well. <clears throat> um, so 2018, um, so far in 2018, we've had eight students graduate, earn their diploma while they were at the, at the youth center. Um, page number four, September 28th, um, 28 students um, had their parents show up for their parent teachers conference, which was fantastic. Um, we're going to have it, we're going to do that again in, uh, in January of 2019. On to the next page. Brad, when you say 28 students, how many could have been there? Well, they, they want to wait till the kids have been there 30 days so they have some information to provide to the parents. Um, so I, I think out of the, the kids that were eligible, um, we caught most of them, I'll bet. That's great. Yeah. Really positive. That makes a difference. No, it's, uh, to have the parents. Huge. Um, page number five, we had a career fair on September 21st. We had 14, um, groups show up for that and, uh, we're obviously appreciative of their time and the opportunity that they took to come spend some time with the kids and show them some opportunities that they may not have otherwise considered. Um, the next one will be March of 2019. If we could move on to slide number nine, please. So this is uh, our average daily population. Um, and this is, you know, their estimated numbers. The, the average daily population, the average length of stay are actual numbers. The admissions are estimates based on, well, at this point we've, it includes 11 of the 12 months that, uh, that are in our calendar year. So I, I don't think you're going to see that 9, 10 move a whole lot when I give my next report. But the average daily population through the end of November is 79. The average length of stay is, is 50. And if we could move to slide number, or excuse me, page number 11. And this is uh, how our average length of stay is tracking. Mark and, uh, and Wayne and some others have done a lot of work because we're wanting to pull those numbers together to include the kids that are here less than 24 hours. What we do know right now, and we haven't been able to put them together, um, we're going to get there, but... Uh, the kids that have been there less than 24 hours, when we just isolate those and look at those, their average length of stay is somewhere in the neighborhood of four hours. So I'm, I'm assuming when we bring that in, and it's about, on any given month, there was about 18, 18 to 20 that, uh, that were in that less than 24 hour period. So clearly that's going to bring our length of stay down um, when we combine those two. But, uh, so it's an overall, overall view. We could move to slide number, excuse me, page number 13. Um, if you want to, I got a line of people before oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Speak. Go ahead. So I'll I, I got wait. you down. I'll wait. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so you can see that the adjudicated and pre-adjudicated, um, those would be the juvenile, those would be the kids that are in a juvenile court. The pre-trial and the sentence, those are the kids that are in adult court. So clearly the pre-trial and the pre-adjudicated, um, the kids that are waiting to get to court, that's 57% of our population combined between the adult and, and juvenile systems. Um, if we could move to slide number 18, please. Court jurisdiction at admissions, 84% um, of our kids, when they show up at our door, are in juvenile court. 14% are in, uh, in adult court. And again, we can see that switch, or where it kind of swung back in uh, between 2014 and 2015. You see the significant drop from the county court kids, um, 241 down to 83. But then it's kind of picked up on the juvenile side. It increases from 755 to 845. The interesting thing, I think, is just what's happened to that uh, the adult court or the county court population since that switch, and it was a it was a uh, statutory switch that pushed the class um, three and four felonies, made sure that they started in uh, in juvenile court. Um, so clearly, you would have expected the adult system to or the adult court kids to uh, to drop at that moment in time, but uh, it's 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 risen quite a bit since that time, 83 in 2015 to 123 in in 2018. Slide number 20, excuse me, page number 20, please. So these are the reasons that the kids are showing up our, at our door. 50% of them show up with, uh, with a new charge or a new offense. Um, the combination of the violation of probation, KPS unlawful absences equals 39%. Those are the kids that would be under the jurisdiction of probation. And then the juvenile court holds um, failure to appear in county court and juvenile court. And the next page, 21, um, and I, I, that slide is getting to be really, really busy, um, but I, and I, I think I need to kind of reel that back a little bit, but you get to those points when you're looking at these statistics, you, it's hard to stop because all of these offenses, when you get to a certain level, have the same number of occurrences, and so how do you shut that <laughs> off? But, so we'll, we'll work on that, um, but there are 17 offenses that account for 91% of our kids. Um, robbery, gun charges, assaults, um, and terrorist threat, threats, those account for about 50% of our, um, our kids that are showing up with, uh, with new, new, new offenses. The next slide or page has admissions by race. Um, Sometimes these raw numbers, I don't know how much they mean, but uh, um, when you look in terms of percentages, which factors in the number of admissions and it kind of accounts for um, the hills and valleys in our admission numbers, um, the African American youth represent 50% of our admissions, Caucasian 24%, uh, Hispanic slash Mexican 22%, Native American 3%, and Asian 2%. That's how that breaks out in, in 2018. Move to slide number 24, please. Um, the home program, and we're going to be meeting um, next Monday to, uh, I think the conversation is about are we doing as much as we can? Is there more that we could do to, to get kids involved in the home program? Um, again, the red uh, bar is an estimate in terms of number of admissions based on what we've seen from January through November of 2018. So we're forecasting roughly 171 admissions um, and 66 of those we anticipate to be successful um, completions and our average daily population this year has been 22. Um, slide number, page number 26 please. Successful? Yes. So out of 171? That's correct. Okay, I just want to get that through my chocolate head. Okay. Um, page number 26, academic credits earned. Um, you heard me say I think I opened with uh, eight kids that have received their uh, high school diplomas, earned the credits for them while they're at the youth center. And we've had years where we've had more than that. Um, but I think this is the one that really 
um, sticks out to me because we're showing that uh, our education department um, will award more credits this year than they have in the last full credits this year than we have in the last 10 years. And uh, that's a credit to the, the people that are working with the kids and, and certainly the kids themselves. Um, that's, that's, that's a significant ach achievement. That's great. Um, page number 28, please. Individual education plans. Um, again, we're estimating that we'll see 153 kids by the end of, well, now this month, by the end of this month. Um, 153 kids will show up with uh, individual education plans, and of that 153, we would have saw 102 of them previously, so 102 of those would have been kids that have, are coming back, are repeating, and that represents 67% of, of those kids that are on individual education plans. And uh, page 32, please. So you can see the mental health crisis intervention um, numbers are um, about as high as we've seen in the last 10 years, 2014 being the exception. So 2,308 uh, crisis intervention sessions, uh, 849 times that a pediatrician or practitioner has spent time with a young person while they're at the youth center. And on slide page number 34, you can see the, uh, <clears throat> the medication that the kids are taking here at the, while they're at the youth center. Um, more often than not, they're showing up at our door with, uh, with these sort of diagnoses. And uh, occasionally there's times when, when they are diagnosed while they're with us. But uh, psychotropics um, generally um, almost every month continues to kind of lead the way for us. The next slide is uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, we, have we have completed 541 tests so far this year, <clears throat> and uh, 62 of those 541 um, were positive tests. And so we had an opportunity to help those kids um, with those issues while at the youth center, or at least initiate that process, if not see it completely through. And we'll move to slide 37. That is. That is my presentation, so I'd be happy to to take any questions, and then uh, Greg's going to take a few minutes of your time as well. Commissioners Kraft, Kavanaugh, and Boyle. Yes. Um, first of all, I want to let the public know that these documents are available on our website. On the agenda, there's a link. This is always a very interesting study. It's worth seeing every slide and studying every slide. And when you have questions about what does that mean, give us a call. Okay. Um, you said the average length of stay by record keeping is going to go down by changing what you're doing, correct? The, the, the direction I've been given to move forward is to continue to track that statistic the way that we have since okay. about 2014, 2015. But I that thought way you, we'll continue to have a trend okay. line. Right, but I thought you were going to track it the way the state, uh, the well, rest of the centers around the state. I think what we're, not what I think, what, I, what we're learning is that when we look at other jurisdictions, um, <clears throat> they're not necessarily calculating that statistic the same way we are. And so if we include <clears throat> those kids that are here even within that first 24 hours, um, we'll have a better chance of kind of comparing apples to apples. Yeah, and when are you going to start that? We're, all, we're, we're trying to get there right now. Okay. Uh, Mark's got the data entered for uh, each of the months this calendar year. Now we just have to combine those yeah. two. And, and one of the pages we didn't talk about was Dusk to Dawn. Are, are, is uh, Mark going to talk about that when he gets up? Okay, good. I'll wait. Um, you said the home program, and Mike asked a question about, I think it was 62 that were successful. Mm -hmm. What does success mean in that program? That means they did not, they, they, they completed, they did not return to, uh, to the youth center. Okay, um, thank you. And, and um, in any of our programs, do we teach anger management? Yes, we have behavior Good. management. And uh, drug counseling as to, okay. Now, what about medication counseling, such as those on uh, specialized medicines that they need to take to control themselves? Do we counsel them on how important that is? 
and do we give them guidance on how they can access that medication if they cannot afford it after their term is up? We, we do both, and, and my hope is that we're going to do better here going forward. Um, we're, you guys, you, you guys, excuse me, you will recall a, a, a presentation with uh, Dr. Liu from yes. uh, Charles yes. Drew and uh, Kenny McMorris, or excuse me, Kenny McMorris from Charles Drew and uh, Dr. Liu from <coughs> UNMC. Um, We've had a couple of meetings since that. Uh, we actually have a phone call this evening, this afternoon at five, um, to see how this is going. And, and I think, you know, the medication management piece I think is going to be really, really big. Um, I also think that uh, some opportunities that they may have to to move evaluations through quicker um, are encouraging. And so it's going to be kind of exciting to see to see where this goes. Thank you. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thanks for the report. Good job. Yes, sir. Um, just a couple things. On page 9, where you deal with the um, average daily population, um, it appears that since about 2013, it's kind of plateaued out uh, in this, you know, 79, 80. Um, and I was just wondering, in, on all of our analysis of statistics, programs, everything. I don't see in any of the reports, particularly this latest Douglas County Juvenile Services Comprehensive Community Plan report, any analysis on how can we or will we impact that number to bring it down? Um, are you aware of, of any analytical, empirical information on how we could impact on that population of 80 that stayed the same for the last five years, anyhow, uh, in a downward fashion. Well, you know, Commissioner Rogers is you know, appropriately points towards the legislation in July of 2019, and it's going to limit, you know, intake. We don't control that front door probation intake. Right. And so uh, they're going to be somewhat further limited in terms of the kids that, that can come through. Um, and then the, you know, whether or not a kid has a, uh, has a placement um, doesn't seem to, isn't going to matter in terms of whether or not they're going to stay with us. They're going to have to find somewhere. And yeah. so those, and 39% of our kids are, are with probation. So. Right, right. So <clears throat> by impacting on that violation, and these, these violation actions or court actions are filed by the county attorney, right? Yes. The county attorney has a discretion then not to file them, or if we use well, other means. Early on in the system, it's the county attorney. Once they're on probation, and it's a probation officer that's making that determination, and then they'll have a uh, revocation hearing, and the county attorney will get involved. Okay. So between the county attorney and the probation right. office, we can get them perhaps to uh, look at how many kids we put into the system under that category of probation violation. Is that what you're saying? I don't know how objective it's going to be. It may be somewhat subjective, so it's going to be, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be probation's responsibility right. in, in both regards. But that's one of the entry ports for this population. If we, could, if we can affect a change there, perhaps different categories of what a violation is or how we deal with, you know, a kid who's maybe having trouble on probation before we violate him, that would have, that would have, afford us an opportunity maybe to to lower the number that are actually showing up at your doorstep under that category. Is that what is that what I'm hearing? I believe so. You know, and I hope I'm not getting off subject here, but one of the things I walked away from the Minneapolis trip was, uh, you know, we all want to look at how many kids they've got in their facilities, and sometimes it's equally important to find out why those other kids aren't there. Um, right. And they only had 39 kids on a, in out-of-home placements. If you only have, and I couldn't tell you, ours is hundreds. And if you only have 39 and, and you're not, so you're not looking at hundreds, now you're only looking at 39, yeah. clearly the opportunity to violate is, is much less. Yeah. Um, that's something that I think we should be paying attention to. Well, and then, you know, that goes to another point where the Minneapolis thing in many ways may be better than what we've got going here and we can learn some stuff, but it's so much different 
Yeah, it's difficult. difficult to see yeah. how we you know, can turn that key mm -hmm. and make it happen quickly. I think uh, I read someplace, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, that the average length of stay in that facility is like seven days. Yeah, and uh, it wasn't me. It was, uh, I think it was Joy Suter that was with us. Um, she had a conversation, kind of a side conversation, and explained how we factor or calculate our length of stay. And I can't remember whether we were at uh, Hennepin or Ramsey. I can't remember which one it was. I want to say it was, was it Ramsey? It was at Hennepin. And uh, the person that she was talking to said, you know, if we factored it that way, our length of stay would probably be very, very similar to yours. So it's important that we... Oh. I see. Okay. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, how you count is Absolutely. the key to it. And it's got to be the same categories in both yep. systems. Okay. So that would be one possible avenue to address this population disparity, which is the, the probation violation avenue. And you mentioned one other that might help us. It was that a placement, a more robust placement? My understanding is the legislation will um, does not allow for the fact that you can't find a placement is is not a reason for them to be detained. So they're really going to have their hand forced here. Okay. Uh, and we spend considerable resources on placement on on you know out of home and truly out of state placement. Uh, I don't know that, that you're familiar with those figures, but it's a big I am not. I, the state does. We don't. Yeah. yeah we don't so that's good to know. The other thing I have to ask is, and this bothers me uh, because we see it all the time and it, it doesn't appear to get better. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at it and it looks like it's worse. This admission by race category on page 22, where good news is since 2008, when this goes back 10 years, our population's come down uh, significantly, although. In 2008, the largest single segment of our population were African-American kids. Bad news is, in 2018, although the population is down significantly, the percent of population, that is minority kids, has actually gone up. Yes. So while we're detaining fewer children, we're detaining proportionally more minority kids. Um, and, and, you know, again, you receive what comes in the door. You don't have a selection process at yes, Douglas sir. County Youth Center. But is there any empirical evidence that you're aware of that would allow us to maybe address that point? Because like the average daily population, the average daily population, I mean, the lower is the better. This is so out of whack with the demographics of our community that it, it really concerns me that we're basically uh, running a, uh, a youth center to detain minority children way out of proportion to their representation in the population. Do you have any, uh, and if you don't, you know, it's not, not something that I'm saying um, that you should know the answer you to. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you just have to chip away at, I, I think. And, and I don't believe that it's the juvenile justice or criminal justice systems that are going to have all the answers in this regard. Um, it's a societal issue, for sure. Um, you know, I recall a long time ago when we did a better job, the courts did a better job of, of tracking where kids were coming from, their addresses. That had a huge um, impact on the Latino population who tended to be much more transient, and their, 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 their addresses changed more often. They did a better job of, of tracking that, and, and, it, and it reduced the failure to appears. And then we took it a step further, and this was like in 2010 or 2011, and uh, intake started to screen those kids who were coming in on failure to appears. And the number of failure to appear kids dropped significantly. And, and I think that was, uh, yeah, 2010, 2011. And so we went from roughly 129 kids to 104. And that was, that was the reason for that, for that drop back then. So the, those, it's those kind of things. And, and really, Mark's, you know, he's been the DMC co-chair for the last several years. So um, he's, he's the expert in the room right here. But there's things I think you can get your hands around. I know Mark and I have talked about. We always bring up the IEPs. And uh, we know that uh, the, 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 the kids of color are overrepresented in that group. And so 
it seems to me like that might be something that you can actually get your hands around and, and hope to, to make some sort of an impact with. Okay. Well, I mean, we'll continue this discussion. You can expect the questions from me in this category on you know, yep. an ongoing basis. I really appreciate your dedication, and uh, these monthly reports are very helpful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. But the reports are very helpful. I have a, a question about, I, I think when we look at Minneapolis, I'm curious if someone who went or someone has a contact with them can uh, uh, find out uh, how their prosecutor handles offenses, what offenses, and, um, you know, whether they have a very active gang unit like we do and that sort of thing. I think what's happening is we're looking in the wrong place. I think what happens, why these... Um, uh, the people of, well, young people of color are there, is that there is a concentration in their community. Uh, we have a very active and successful gang unit. And um, whether these kids are in gangs or not, I don't know, but uh, I th there's a focus. And so when you focus on something like that, it kind of reminds me back in the day I got a call from a, um, a Protestant church. <laughs> and Sunday there was a police officer who was ticketing every car that was parked what did say no parking, but they parked there anyway on Sunday to go to church. And it was technically, yeah, it was a violation, but it was Sunday, you know, I mean, they were going to church and stuff. Anyway, they all got tickets. There were like 25 people who had tickets. So, I mean, when you focus on that, you're going to get a certain bunch of people. And that's what this makes me think. So I'm curious, I think it'd be helpful to know if when the population is so low in Minneapolis, uh, they're doing something quite differently <clears throat> way back when in who they're arresting, what kind of offenses they're looking for, uh, whether they have a, an aggressive prosecutor, whether they have an aggressive unit of police enforcement, that can really make the difference. So I'd be curious. Uh, that Those are some of the things we need to talk about uh, with our own uh, people here in Omaha uh, about, you know, prosecution and so forth. But I, I appreciate you really, these, these reports really <coughs> stimulate a lot of thought. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sorry. Commissioner Moore. A couple things. I'm going to kind of address what Commissioner Boyle said first. Um, you made arrangements for me to talk to Maricopa County. Yes, sir. And it's kind of interesting. I did that uh, in the last month or two. And so anyhow, here you have a population, Maricopa County, of over 4 million. It's around 4'2", 4 4'3". They have two facilities. They have one in the western, not too far west from the downtown, but closer to the downtown area on the west side. Then they have one further out in Mesa on the east side of Maricopa County. And I spent a few hours. They run at 80 to 100 at each facility with a population that's seven times our population at least. And, you know, the, the facility does have the courts, the detention, and all of that right there. The attorneys come out there. I can't say the attorneys are in the building. But uh, anyway, they're there. But um, I was amazed it's that low, and they have a tremendous gang problem there in Maricopa County. Uh, so it is kind of interesting how those numbers vary from ours and where we are. The other thing we heard in Minneapolis that I was going to ask you, Brad, and I appreciate, I wasn't going to go unless you were going up to <laughs> Minneapolis because I wanted to hear it with you, and you have so much more knowledge. But they talked about the shelters out in the community at some of our meetings up in Minneapolis. Claire was there. And I'm just curious, do we have the same kind of thing there in the, the housing? You know, there's just independent shelters I, around I, I, I do the recall. downtown area and right. all that. Um, I do recall them talking about that, and, and I know that the, the the school for the post-adjudicated youth, that was a county-run facility. The guy that, uh, that, that runs that showed up a little late for that meeting and was sitting next to me, so I got an opportunity to talk to him a little bit. Um, there were some talk of, of shelters. I don't know whether those, I don't recall whether those were, were county or if they were um, privately run operations. They did tell us they were privately. I think, yeah. And Claire, you'd right. be 
free to correct me, but I, they did. I asked that if those were their shelters because I would change the population. They said, no, they're independent, and they were located all over. And it was kind of interesting. In St. Paul, um, they're both downtown. The one in Minneapolis is a block. It's been there 10 years. I think I'm stating that correctly. It was the 90s, yeah. Yeah. And um, it's within a block or block and a half of the new ball stadium that they built in the last five years where the Vikings play and so on. And there's also condominiums around it. And then in St. Paul, there's really, it's right downtown also with nice restaurants and everything close by that detention facility also. And we saw that. Um, so the other thing I want to say, and I want you to correct, don't worry about offending me ever. And I've told you that before privately, you know, to disagree. The facility out, because I asked him the question about that other facility that's out the 20 miles or whatever, they talked about that being a treatment facility, not the same. And that's where we send our youth out to a treatment center away from Omaha. We don't have that same kind of thing, do we? They had, they have something similar to our YRTCs. They do, um, but the the school I think is, and and we would honestly, we were there for less than eight hours when we visited two facilities, so we didn't get to get in the weeds a whole lot. But uh, um, the school was for a different group of kids than what their facilities that would have been somewhat similar to our YRTCs. I think are designed to, to help with. And I do think there was some discussion, I don't want to get off on that, but I think there was some discussion this morning about, you know, it's for another day, using our present facility if we choose to come down to put it all together here, uh, to use that present facility for something that we could really make positive and hopefully in the mental health area and maybe some of that treatment. But I don't want to get off on that. But Brad, I do appreciate the work you do there. And uh, I will come out to play ping pong with you now that my spinal column is healed a bit. Now my back screwed up. I so. want to be ready for you. <laughs> and real quick on Phoenix, um, just one point. Just uh, they don't, They're not holding kids that are in adult court. And I don't know what that number is there, but uh, but they their kids that are in adult court are somewhere in their adult system. Okay. Just a point of clarification. Yeah. That's the last question, question Brad. So I guess Brad's coming. But let me, I, I'd like to add to a couple of points that were made to some degree. I mean, the, the talk was mentioned about Minneapolis. And just know Minneapolis was is way more progressive, the state has implemented some things, and those things are coming here later. And so <clears throat> some of the things that they are doing are in statute, and some of that thing, and some of those things, what was mentioned in respects to um, Commissioner Boyle mentioned the attorneys, and most of these places where this stuff is driving and driving hard, it is led by the prosecutor's office. It's led by the county attorneys. They are um, there. Um, place we went to in a uh, county of 5,000 or so up in South Dakota, maybe smaller. It's, it's led from that office. And so, um, you know, Don's been on board with this and talking, but I think, you know, we shouldn't make any um, assumption that everybody in office is on board, and that's going to be a fight that Don has to fight in some respects, and, and I think this, the board needs to keep pushing. But the other piece, too, is I think with the probation piece, uh, once you know, they get into that process, it's it's within the court. And, and Brad made this, this, and this is the conference and conversation that is bigger than the building. Uh, Brad made the point about something similar to the YRTCs. I mean, they made no bones about it that they, as a judiciary, a juvenile judiciary, do not like the YRTCs. So that's an option to some degree that's not there that, you know, in this bigger discussion of services that's, that's there to have. You know, I, I I was hoping Mary could come today, but she's out of town, and my hope is to have her come next year to answer these questions so she can explain some of those steps that they're taking to, to get to some degree. And my hope is to have her next month if she's not out and traveling to some degree. So um, I just want to add that in the mix. 
uh, Commissioner Borgs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Brad, t tell me the difference because there's about a 20, almost 20 some day difference between length of stay for kids that are not probation versus kids that are probation. So what's the difference and what are we doing about that? <laughs> Uh, it's on page uh, 12, wasn't it? 12. Yeah. Um, so the youth that are not on probation, you're, you're pointing out that, uh, and it looked, look, I wish I should have an average there for the entire year on the far right, but just looking at the months, it, it appears that, 12. that each month, most months are higher than the kids that are on probation, right? 12. 12. 12. So I, I, my best guess is the kids that are not on probation are those kids that, uh, that would be going through the evaluations and some other things that are happening earlier on that, uh, that we would all like to see shorten up. The kids that are on probation are the kids that have lost their placement, violated, um, ran from their placements. And um, unfortunately, once they do that, they seem to be uh, more difficult to place. But that's not showing here. What am I They're missing? showing on page 12, unless I'm reading it wrong, it's the first one is juvenile not on probation and their length of stay in November, just use November because it's mm -hmm. there, is 51. Yep. Then you go down to probation and theirs is 35. Yep. So maybe I'm reading it wrong, but that tells me they're moving through faster than the kids that aren't on probation. They should. I mean, honestly, they should move through for it faster. The kids that are not on probation, they're the ones that you're waiting on the evaluations for. Um, you're waiting on, um, well, the detention hearing happens right away within the first 24 hours. But then you're waiting on all of those pretrial hearings that would lead to a, 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 an adjudication hearing and ultimately a disposition. And within all that process, you have the length of time necessary to complete an evaluation. So those are certainly going to but that's what we're using. Those are the ones that are going to stay longer. The ones that are on probation, their length of stay, honestly, I think for the most part is because they ran or acted up at a placement and now all of a sudden they, um, I hate, they're labeled and, and it becomes more difficult for them to, to go back to another placement. Otherwise, their length of stay should not even be 35 days. But even though, so the 51, just again, you can go across the page, but those non-probation ones are the ones that we're working on with the partnership with UNMC and Creighton and Charles Drew and Heartland and Reach, all that, to get those evaluations and assessments done faster, which would, again, reduce Correct. that length of stay, get yes. them through faster. We're intervening to get them through faster. And then the probation ones, um, I think, again, that and maybe that's a statute, Commissioner Rogers, that you're referring to, but um, so violation of probation is that it just an automatic, you're back in, you're, you violate your probation for whatever reason, you're in the detention center, period. Well, I mean, my understanding is they have graduated sanctions and they don't necessarily knee jerk and put them back at the youth center, but uh, yeah, we certainly, obviously, we've got So those are two populations yeah. that we can really drill down on to try to get a little bit more yes. data, data on. Yeah, I mean, I think you can, it depends on who you ask, and, and I won't say that there's some people that feel some of those kids are there. Some of them are there for, you know, they violated probation, but some feel that it's kind of a, I'm, I'm mad at you violate probation because right. you didn't do what right. I told you to do, and it really didn't justify being in there. That's just, that's my reciprocation of what I've heard. And also, there may be a small amount of them that I, my understanding that, that aren't on probation that are, uh, are federal kids that they send to us that serve, they're serving time, uh, for lack of we better We get to a few federal so, yeah. kids, but it's, it's not very many. Yeah, I just want to make it, it's not clear, pure. This is and those are all in there. adult court. Yeah. But then that also drills into the whole issue that we've been working on for a number of years, and that's that disproportionate minority contact issue. Um, that's why we hired a coordinator 
to look at our system points and again if you remember when we were uh, JDA I was up here um, last week I think it was or whatever last, last month we looked at the zip code map and there's three zip codes um, with the highest population of kids that are in our youth center and two of those highest ones come from the North Omaha area so again we have the opportunities to really drill down um, what we're looking at um, because if you start to try to address those issues I think you then are able to address a lot of issues countywide um, the home program tell me again the overall capacity is 50 and and we were having trouble with getting referrals and potentially one of the reasons is is because of the success rate not being as high as it should be or what are the reasons why they're unsuccessful and do again these are all discussions that I'm going to be very very interested in having on what we can do different with the home program because to me that is the home program is a superb program if if we can figure this out to keep kids out of the system uh, out of the detention center yeah that, that success rate dropped when we started taking the kids on diversion and it's our opinion that uh, that they're coming to us kind of 11th hour I mean they have very little wiggle room in terms of the system they do we don't have a whole lot of opportunities to to try to change their behavior before they pull them off of, of diversion and we would like to see them come earlier and I think that would be helpful well I can't wait to talk about that because again that's a important important program and then the um, IEPs I know I've mentioned it before and wondered if there was any more conversation or work done on um, bringing in or assessing, and this would be working with the schools as well, um, the issue of dyslexia. Um, because, I mean, the more I read, the more I hear, the more work that's being done on that, a lot of times there is a misdiagnosis, of, if you will, they may be di they may have dyslexia, but it's being diagnosed as a behavioral health issue versus getting treated for that. So, I think that we need to try to figure out a way to work with um, Clarice to have her come in and and we start really assessing or have the schools assess and so we know when they're coming to us that that's what they have. Um, and then lastly. Um, I was I think I'm going to try to start talking about mental health as mental medical um, your mental health is a part of your whole health and it shouldn't be separated and we keep we continue to treat it as such um, it's kind of the you know, you, 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 if you have a heart attack, you're not going to be placed on a waiting list. You're going to be treated and you're going to be looked at and you're going to be treated. If you have mental issues, you're going to be sitting in a room and waiting until there's available bed um, or waiting till a psychiatrist comes to see you or whatever the case may be. And I think we, again, I think we've done a wonderful job of elevating the conversation about one's mental health being a part of their whole health. Um, but I found it interesting that there's places now that are calling it mental medical rather than mental health because it's getting, getting addressed quicker um, than it has been in the past. So I think we continue to still work on that. Um, if we can figure out and try to treat those um, kids and even their families at an early um, part of their behavior problems then it's going to keep them out of our adult system um, or recidivating back into our youth system numerous times so look forward to those discussions Commissioner Boyle Marks, I appreciate what Commissioner Borgeson just said, especially about mental medical. That's a great concept. I want to ask about, um, it concerns me on page 14, 
when you look at the um, admissions, uh, and I please don't take this as any kind of a loaded question or something, but if you look at the total down below, uh, <coughs> going from January to November, and it peaks in uh, May, where we have 90 that are admitted, uh, this is where uh, this is where I think. Uh, unless we get these programs put together, uh, home and the rest of them, and trying to drive down the, the uh, minority, uh, you know, there's, there's things causing this. It's the judges, and it's, you know, I mean, it's at some point maybe, but it's certainly the prosecution and, what, and the offenses they're being picked up for and all this other stuff. So we have 90, ki 90 people in the facility in May of 2018. If we build the facility uh, downtown with, uh, I don't know, 70, what are we thinking, 60 spots? What do we do with the other 30, you know? And I just think we need to do, someone today suggested, um, maybe it was Tyler said, you know, we need to, we need to uh, <clears throat> work on these programs first and then build what kind of responds. And I really, not that we can do that, but I don't know that we have the programs in place that are adequate to drive that number down. Um, and I do want to suggest you know, uh, is that Part of the philanthropic uh, part could be building these homes, that, and you know we have a lot of people, young people, foster coming out of foster care that have no place to go. They don't know how to, you know, boil an egg. To tell you the truth, I mean they've never had that kind of a lot of them that kind of experience. So anyway, I just uh, I mentioned that, and I think uh, Commissioner Borgerson, you made some very good remarks about this, and I appreciate it. Thank you. So you got Brad. Greg's next. Yeah, um, Greg's going to come up, but just real quick. Um, I'll get we, you after. I'll get you out the grades. <clears throat> We've tied him to the, uh, brought him in, as we mentioned, at the MDT meetings. And so you get a bunch of different people from different professions and um, all in a room together talking about young people. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're breaking that up a little bit. I mean, that group's going to continue to go. Um, but Greg's going to actually chair a group of people that I think, and not I, but honestly they, think that uh, might have a, uh, more of an opportunity to impact the expediting. Um, he has had some success with getting kids into court um, for evaluations quicker, and we've seen some of that. So uh, we're starting to see some of the fruits of our labor, but um, hopefully there's there's more to be done. I'll turn it over to Greg. Hold up, Brad. You got another question? Just one last follow-up on uh, what Commissioner Boyle was asking you about. The proposals in front of us for this um, youth center uh attention center vary from you know 48 beds in the hdr proposal for downtown with 16 unfinished you know room for expansion or 80 currently at the youth center that we have refurbished of course um do you know of a way say we were to begin construction on that what is a cell block downtown with 48 finished beds and it's got an 18 to 24 month construction cycle. Do you know a way, following up on Commissioner Boyle's question, of how we get from our population of 80 to the 48 beds proposed in the HDR proposal in that period of time? How, how would we get from 80 to 48 in two years' time? Do you know? If, if you don't, say you don't, but I'm, I'm interested because I mean, the it only would thing have that, to be done. It, it, and I've, I've been upfront and honest, and, and I've felt like I've kind of gotten put in the middle of, of a lot of this, and all I've tried to do is, was just prevent, present information and be honest. That's, that's all I've tried to do. And so hopefully uh, I've come across that way. I, and, I, and I've said all along that that, that does concern me. And I, there's work that we could do, and I've said this all along too, um, with the kids that are in probation. I, I mean, hell, we went to... I'm sorry, excuse me. We went to uh, Minneapolis. They hardly had any kids in, pro in on probation. Yeah. You know, um, Ronnie and I were out in King County. They don't have any probation violators. There's a, there's a second side to that story, though. When you go talk to the people that are working probation, they will flat out tell you that that's not a good idea. The kids walk all over them, and the kids end up, we talk about not pushing the kids deeper into the system. Right. They end up pushing the kids deeper into the system because they don't hold them accountable until it's too late and all of a sudden they're faced with an adult charge. So I do believe that the probation needs to play a role. Are they playing too large of a role right now? You know, those are the kind of things. And then um, to the legislation this coming July of 2019, you know, what kind of an impact will that have? But, uh, yeah. Very good. Well, thank you. Well, let me answer that question because this is, and I respect your. Your, your point, we've had that point. 
the, the people controlling it feel they can hit it. And <clears throat> personally, this argument has happened uh, when we were at 144 beds and it went down to 24 staff detention. People were saying, well, you know, what if we need the new beds? Then, uh, quietly, you know, with the Prison Rape, Rape Elimination Act, it, its total capacity now is 96. You know, and this is just my feel on it. Everybody says, well, what if there's a big uh, haul of kids to some degree? If there's a big haul of kids because of PREA, we could do it and be in uh, overtime and things of that sort. The fact is when, when the statute change happens to, to bring us to a point, and unfortunately, if we listen to everybody in the past that said, oh, well, this is not enough, this is not a, enough, we wouldn't be here. There was, there was squawking when the state uh, stopped putting status offenders there, and now nobody wants to go back to that. So, you know, I understand the, the angst and some of the concern where everybody else, but to some degree, uh, 48 to 60 beds is policy in itself, because if you stay to saying everybody's, well, I'm concerned about this and that, you don't force the system to get where it's at. It's going to be forced next year. The state is going to force it, and the state is probably going to continue to do those things, because there's talk about the state making changes that status offenders cannot be on probation. You know, we are number two in the country with status offenders on probation. And those status offenders take up time from the probation officers, the judges, the county attorneys, where they can't deal with the kids that they really need to deal with. So, and I mean in respect to all the opinions, but, you know, if we took that approach, we wouldn't be here where we are now. So I, I, don't, I don't have any fear of going there and doing it. I think it forces everybody in the system to step up with the services. And no matter what happens, we won't have a building up next year. We're going to be forced to deal with it next year in the current status. So I just say that, that, you know, the, the future is not having them there to get services. And we need to embrace that and be ready to roll. Brad, you want to bring Greg up? Okay, Greg. <clears throat> Good afternoon. So, which, I mean, okay, I, I'm gonna need to manage this a little bit um, because of time on the clock and us getting pushed out of here. But also, um, I'm gonna just ask you to be tight, and so if we can get through. I'll okay. be very concise. Greg Hepburn, Douglas County Youth Center. Um, the report in its structure has not changed. Um, as I've gone through this now for a um, few months, I've started to identify certain things, um, start to be able to really pinpoint a direction in which I think would glean. Can we put this on the screen maybe? It's not showing. It's not showing. No. We need to modernize this. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> It's not your fault. It's, it's enlarging, though. It's, <laughs> month by month, it's getting bigger. <laughs> I'll come in with a poster board next time. <laughs> so um, just a few things. Um, in the process of looking at what are some of the obstructions to release, a few things stand out. One in particular is obviously the uh, psyche valves and the different types of evaluations that are being ordered. Um, they're causing a long, the, the court date to be put out uh, because the availability for clinicians to be able to conduct those evaluations isn't as readily available. So that's one. Another that you'll notice is uh, motions to either revoke, to transfer, or um, to uh, commit to a particular treatment. Those are also 
uh, pushing court dates back because it's a matter of um, obtaining information, you know, to uh, be able to figure out what they want to do with uh, each particular detainee. Uh, another thing that you'll see on here is um, juveniles who are in adult court. Uh, they're here. On, they're there on bond, and they're not able to post bond. I believe there's maybe anywhere from five to uh, six uh, of juveniles who are on the report that are there for that. With that being in mind, when you look at the the uh, release orders or applications that are being made by probation to uh, send uh, youth to particular places, started breaking them down into either 30-day segments, 60-day segments, 90, or 120. And uh, from the youth after, well, between the admit date of 227 to 8-3, um, uh, August 3rd, the, that's the 120 day and beyond mark. So there's only one youth within that sector who um, even has some type of placement readily available, and it's at OHB and there's a bed waiting for them. Between that, the numbers you know tend to increase, of course, after the 90 day mark, because particularly it's the severity of the crime that's being committed, you know, that's keeping them there that long. So those are just a few of the things. Um, I believe that we have, and I don't have it on this report, but I believe that we have nine youth that are waiting for evaluations, or as of uh, 1129, were waiting for evaluations. So those are just some of the things that are kind of driving the numbers um, up from this standpoint. And again, as I continue to dissect and get into these numbers a little bit more, different things are popping up, and um, I'm able to really kind of, you know, assess those things. Okay. Any questions? What, tell me, what's this committee you chairing again? It's the uh, case processing. Oh. I co-chair. I know case that. Processing. So I thought it was something new. Okay. No, so right. it's, it, but what we're looking at doing is um, doing a true MDT okay. for the case processing and bringing that meeting into the center? On a weekly basis. Okay, okay, that's the, okay, I got it. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thanks for this. You get better every time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, there's just a few on here that I, I, I guess I have just, if you know, questions on. Mm -hmm. on, on the back page, um, top um, individual, looks like to, to be a 12-year-old boy. Um, who's been there since October 31st, and it says lost placement at Boys Town Shelter Psychological. Could you expand on that a little bit? What does that mean? Right. He's 13 now, um, but the- Had his that, birthday in the youth center, didn't he? He, he did, yes, that's, that's correct. Uh, so, what's that? And, and, and we had cake for him. We celebrated his birthday, okay. so. so um, but, uh, the placement in particular for this uh, young man that he lost, um, I don't, I'm not sure of the specifics of it because I'm not on the units as much talking with the youth since I'm in this capacity. Um, I hope to be able to get myself back into that because it really tells, it paints a better picture of each of the youth on here, but uh, there's a variety of things. It could be um, attack on a peer, it could be attack on a staff member, it could be just uh, not um, amenable to uh, the treatment that's being provided at the time. I mean, there's just a, a broad range. And uh, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, certain about that particular situation. Okay. Um, there are some here that are being held just kind of on, on motion status, it looks like. A couple mm -hmm. down from the one we just talked about mm -hmm. is a motion to transfer to county court. And this is a 17-year-old kid since November 7th. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if you're aware of the, you know, what motion we're talking about or why, why a kid would be held on a, on a motion hold. Do you, do you know anything about that? So the, I've, I've sat and I've testified for uh, several kids that are in there um, who, are, who are seeking a motion to transfer from adult to juvenile court. And um, the biggest hindrance in that is just scheduling the time frame to be able to get everything together from what I've found. But this looks like a motion to transfer to county court. Right. right. So that would be 
from, from juvenile, from juvenile court to, to adult, to and, 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 and there's been some of those as well, too. Um, but the main thing, I think, with this particular situation is because it came in on a new charge, and birth date may be coming up soon, and so they probably feel like they've exhausted all the resources for this young man. It's probably going to turn 18, and they're looking to charge as an adult. I see. Well, thanks. This is very helpful. You're welcome. Commissioner Kraft. <clears throat> I'm going to ask a big favor, and that's yeah. next time you define some of these terms for us, oh, yeah. such as, because uh, this is a public document, anybody who wants to access it might want to know what terminated means, absconded, okay. um, juve even, J-U-V -E, for juvenile, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, the public may not know what they mean. We've had time to study it. Mm -hmm. um, so please, at the bottom here, make some notes as to what the terms mean. Absolutely. That's an excellent point. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Commissioner Morgs. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Chair. Um, and I have held off saying anything publicly about this um, in hopes that I was going to get a little bit more uh, general information about our youth that are being sent to an adult Lincoln Regional Center for um, services. Um, to me, that's um, unacceptable. And it goes back to the issues of what we need to do and what services we need to have here to address um, our youth and make sure that we have some mental medical services for them. I did reach out to try to find out, not specifics, I didn't want names, I didn't want birth dates, I didn't want any of that. I asked two questions, I believe it was, and that was, why were they in there and what other placements failed or didn't accept them? Just so that we would know what we needed to look at. So as we move through discussions about programs and services, um, players within the system um, need to be a little bit more, uh, let's play nice in the sandbox together because, again, it's in the end, it's for the kids. And a kid, in my opinion, does not belong in an adult Lincoln Regional Center for services. And so, um, again, I'm, I'm not trying to find out or provide any, um, you know, secret information that can't be shared with anybody, I'm just looking to see what we need to look at in terms of programs and services that we need to either build capacity on, speak with those providers to find out what's wrong, or start a new program. That's it. So um, I appreciate the information that you give us on this report because it does shed some light on those discussions that we're having on programs and services, and this is helpful, and I appreciate the work that you do. Um, trying to move our youth through that system, um, and so keep up the good work. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think that's all, Greg. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so uh, again, Brian Smith, six five one six. Uh, my first two questions are actually for uh, Superintendent Alexander. Yeah, Brad. You got to Brad. Brad, you got a couple. Of, okay. okay. So, uh, in regards to what we've seen today, everything's been historical information. So, my my first question is, um, what sort of a uh, strategic plan do you have going forward? Is it a three-year, five-year, ten-year plan for the uh, for managing the DCYC? In 10 minutes. <laughs> um, in what regard? Are you talking specifically about the population? Just specific, no, just specifically uh, what, uh, how long do you plan out for? We have a five year plan. Okay. So, um, so the follow up question to that the answer is a uh, DCYC has a five year plan. So, my question here is we have all this historical data, but my, um, I'm curious about how, where you get information for forecasting projections um, for the number of kids in detention, for staffing, for things of that nature. Where what sort of uh, forecast data do you uh, do you receive from from the county or any other sources? 
you know, we do a, a staffing analysis. That's a part of it. And we <clears throat> know how many living units we have. We know how many people are required to work on those living units. Um, Priya came into play. Obviously, that increased our, our staffing as we had to be at I'm sorry. I'm terrible about that. Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, it requires that there's a one to eight staffing ratio for the kids. So <clears throat> the board stepped up and supported me in terms of the additional staff that was going to be required. Um, so we, we, we met that criteria. Okay. So I guess for the next, <clears throat> if we're looking at 2019, 2020, 2021, um, and you look at your staffing needs, how do you, where do you get the information as far as the number of uh, juveniles that you expect to have in detention? I mean, what we've done historically is looked at the historical information in terms of predicting what we can expect going forward. So my next question um, actually goes to, to Commissioner Rogers. This is in regards to the uh, uh, comprehensive plan, the, the juvenile justice, um, uh, Douglas County Juvenile Justice Comprehensive Plan, 135 pages. I've looked over it. I've read a good chunk of it. Um, and it, there's historical data in there, and there's some intentional programming data uh, information, but I'm curious, um, how does the county then, or, or OIS or whoever's been involved in putting that together, how do you model out the data forecasting for, you know, for, the, uh, for the next few years' needs? The plan is done every three years. As of about six years ago, uh, that plan, they meet um, with community groups, and they get feedback from the plan, and they do a survey on them with that plan to see what their needs are. Mm -hmm. um, those needs are taken into account. They use a combination of our data and state data. So the plan isn't about detention, because the plan, you need the plan to get right. money to uh, fund programs to keep kids out. So the data. Uh, that's used to some degree is from community input and I'm assuming program uh, data that they get from programs. I'm not exactly sure on mm -hmm. the source, but there's uh, meetings that happen every year and then on the third year there's an extensive uh, survey done with members to get feedback on that plan and then it's uh, going about and approved as final. So specific with in regards to data forecasting and modeling, uh, I didn't see anything in that plan that models out what to, ex what to expect from changes in programs, new programs, increased funding for programs, whatever, whatever actions are recommended in that plan. I didn't see any forecasting. Uh, is there any forecasting that exists? Um, I don't know uh, specifically because the forecasting is not required by the law. I mean, okay. nobody, there's few, we have data and I've stated before that we need a system that allows us to get all that we have data in places but we can't grab it all in one pot. So uh, the forecasting piece is not a requirement by the state because no, only about three counties would be able to fulfill it out of 90. So um, that process, I'll have to ask them to, to talk a little bit about it in detail, but I don't know of any forecasting that's done in that. The only thing I know, like I said, is um, the community input on the ground and they compare numbers from the programs that they had over the years and then they try to uh, anticipate based on the feedback what they think that would be. So but the data, but the need here is not, uh, a lot of the emphasis here is not data forecasting. It is uh, based on results that the input gives them. So to, to extrapolate this for just a second is in the Chin report, there was data forecasting. It said to expect between 133 kids in detention in the next 15, uh, by 2035 or negative 102. Those were those were two of the uh, the forecast options, which is statistically ridiculous, uh, and the the approach that was taken in that uh, is not statistically sound. The question, and then also the Chin report throws into the middle of this a uh, number of 48, which is what we've latched onto. The from what I've seen right now, <clears throat> the county has not provided any sort of statistical modeling that allows us to get to that point. They don't have any statistical forecasting, any predictive analytics, anything that would lead us to believe that whatever programs we're putting in place now are going to make a uh, significant enough difference that will overcome the inertia of the last five years with a steady population. So here's, here's the core of what 
we've been asking for um, from the public, and I think maybe this is the way that I'm going to articulate it at this moment that brings us all together, is that what you're proposing is, is a monumental shift in dollars spent in housing and, uh, and in programs. I'm a, that I've seen in that 135-page report, but nowhere along the line do we have any sort of an idea that this, these actions, we expect them to produce these results. We don't have anything that says, uh, specifically the LB 1112, we expect that to reduce the number of kids in detention by X number, by certain percent, by whatever it is, and we also don't have any sort of predictive analytics that show us that any of the, uh, any of the activities Take, undertaken by the county or its partners as part of that comprehensive plan will yield any sort of expected results? That's a, that's a fair question, but I don't know of any county, I don't know of any government in the country that has predictive analytics. A lot of that is ideal, and if you got that and you want to give it to me, I'll drive that hard to make it happen. The Perfect. fact is, is that the closest that you have to that is CompStats that OPD does to do some things in regards to crime, and they take the crime there mm -hmm. to predict the future. And we do that to the best we can with the QRS and the okay. probation data and other stuff there. So I think your point is fair, and I'll gladly look into it, but th there's, no, a, there's no government entity. The state doesn't even have that. So Well, that's, that is untrue. There are government agencies that do cool. that. Um, well, <clears throat> I, I will also, uh, I, I can get you those, uh, I can get do. you names and numbers. Um, the other thing is, is that Metropolitan Community College 10 years ago ran a predictive analytics uh, <clears throat> pro uh, program with a company here in Omaha called uh, 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 CA, um, <clears throat> which, does, uh, which does predictive analytics, and they did a program on the longevity of the roofs of their particular buildings. Uh, so well, I, will, I will send this information well, to the clerk for distribution to the board. Well, please, and you can, you we, can hand it to me, but, this. but note that you're taking an uh, educational model and trying to apply it here. Now, I was just in a, uh, well, it's been known and it's been reiterated. You, you're asking us to do stuff that I don't know that a government does because even the prediction on the size of what jails are in the future are based on third grade reading scores. So we, that's nothing we're in regards to. I, I think it's a great deal. And when they Perfect. get the model and you give me that information, I'll definitely look into it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, um, Larry. I know you're all tired. I won't keep you long. Larry Store, 5015 Lafayette. I'm sorry? No, you're all right. Go, okay. please. Uh, mission statements. Every one of the philanthropics around Omaha have mission statements. Every youth serving agency has mission statements. And they have had for I don't know how many years. Uh, Mark, you're, you're acquainted with autism. I also am acquainted with autism. Uh, not specifically diagnosed that way, but uh, it's a form of brain injury, a form of brain malfunction, uh, deformity, processing problems. But I have a grandson that had similar things, but he was missing the corpus callosum. Now, what's common in all of this we have youth that are being detained. In some cases, our documents say they're not being detained for the offense they're charged with, and that's confusing. If they're charged with something, why aren't they detained for that? Now, when you take these kids in to assess them, there's long practice in Omaha. Now, I'm going back to third grade when problems started coming up in school and we have special education. Well, there's this overall thing, it's just behavior. It's behavior, it's behavior, it's behavior. Detain that kid, let's take him in for assessment. But maybe you don't do a brain MRI to find out, does he have autism? Does he have mental illness? It comes under big umbrellas, of course. but. You have that checklist that says, oh, yeah, he's got a behavior problem. So we're going to treat him for behavior. We had a candidate running for sheriff's office that said, I'd like to maybe do a militaristic type program to teach them discipline. Tough love? I don't know. Tough love doesn't work with kids that have autism. Uh, they need something a little bit different, don't they, Mark? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. People that don't process this as fast, brain injuries, they need a little bit different treatment programs. So when we're talking about the treatment programs, you know, uh, you have to have an openness with those professionals. But I went to a number of conferences with families and professionals studying the field of brain deformities and brain problems, including autism. I met people at parents, and, and I met the kids. Uh, they had a lot of ba best practices, too, and this goes back to 2007, 2008. And you want to know what? Not one of the professionals in Omaha, in the school system, or at the state house, wanted to talk about their best practices. Not interested because privacy laws. And we know better. We don't have to consult with the guy out at University of California, Los Angeles, that is an expert pediatric neurologist that started that organization. So please ask your professionals that are giving you the input to stop being so expert about everything and get the input from the families and from the kids. I see no kids. I don't see any families. And most of those other situations, I didn't. I've sat in on IEPs, and they really didn't want any input from me. But I've taken my grandson hunting and lots of other things, and I know there are things he can do. But everybody else thinks, no, they probably can't. So they've got locked minds, so be careful what you put them in and who assesses them for what. There's professionals outside of the system that should have been doing that in the school system. That's what the, edu the special education program was started for. Why aren't we using it there? Thank you. Thank you. We're going to item D, community services, and item one is resolution opposed any proposed constructions of dams by the Papio, Missouri, MRD and the state encourage alternatives to low-impact flood methods. Commissioner Boyle. I'd like to postpone that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'll second that. I, I already owe it. Four hours. <laughs> I know it. I already owe these two lunch, for starters. Plus, uh, let's just get right to it. Uh, this, um, I'll just, I, I'm going to cut to the chase. I handed out uh, to everybody here who's uh, going to be testifying, as well as the commissioners are getting the information. Uh, I uh, numbered the pages, and... Um, uh, if uh, I guess I'd focus on primarily the um, Nebraska cases, which are uh, on, uh, let's see, I think it's page uh, two, uh, and maybe on one to some extent too. But if you look at page two over at the left, it's got Gage County and uh, Holt and Garfield and Loop County. And the uh, uh, bottom line on this is that uh, if you switch over to, the, uh, to page one, it kind of really summarizes it pretty well. Uh, Loop Valley, Wheeler counties uh, in... Uh, 2010, in the summer of 2010, they had 10 failures, uh, including, and they list the names over there in pretty small type, Grade Creek, Erickson, and so forth, and Brett Howard. It says the village of North Loop uh, was evacuated due to this failure of this dam, the Brett Howard. And the next line says, heavy rains led to uh, dam failures in Atkinson, Burwell, North Loop, Sargent, Scola, Spalding, and Taylor. And then at the far right, uh, there's some summary of news accounts uh, but the bottom one says, NEMA says 10 Nebraska dams failed during heavy rains. That really sums it all up. There's Texas on here. Uh, of course, the classic case of a dam failing at Rapid City uh, at to Canyon Lake that sent water rushing into uh, uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh, it uh, killed 238 people, and uh, 3,000 people were injured. Dams are really nice things. I mean, and even the world, the world had a right. It said these dams are built and it talked about for development. That's what it's all about. And I don't care if that's done, but I, I don't want this um, presented at, or used as flood control because it's not. It's really obvious it's not. Uh, we have an alternative that we need to talk to the resource district about. They're in charge of this uh, function, but uh, I hope they will uh, come around and think about uh, uh, another process called low impact development because what that does it's really i think an interesting concept it really shifts the burden to the property owner to control the water so for example at the west road shopping center uh, under federal law unless that's been suspended who knows uh, they are supposed to be controlling the water that comes off of their property and one of the reasons is that they uh, the uh, it, all this water that comes off now uh, goes into the system and it's oil from cars and all these other uh, 
uh, drippings that take place, it all goes right back into the streams, which they've been trying to stop. If you have a, uh, uh, and Kent Holm is here, and he can speak to this eloquently, if there are some low impact development uh, and it's put in place, if you look at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, as you pass 42nd Street, there's a very, a very nice looking kind of a pond thing with rocks and so forth, and there's a greenery and so forth. That's low impact development. The water comes off those lots, goes into there, goes and percolates down into the ground, and the, it doesn't cause all this contamination. That is what I'm concerned about, and I'm not going to talk anymore. Kent, would you please come down for a moment? And I, I think he may have some materials, and then I want to hear from, uh, and I apologize deeply for having the two of you here uh, that long, particularly. Kent, would you make some, you're prepared, I think, to make some comments, perhaps, about low impact development and uh, what, it, what it means, and also dams, if you would? Um, sure. Kent Holman, Environmental Services Director. Uh, I guess just a couple of things. I, I have some some photos and some other things if you'd like to see them. But, right. Um, you know, one of the things that the that the county has done from a comprehensive plan standpoint is to uh, use conservation design and and tr and designating open space to to try to keep development away from creeks, other yes. water bodies, and and there's really kind of a two two different things that are going on here. One there's there's a lot of development that goes on that encroaches on the on the historic floodplains and the areas where rivers creeks have traditionally been allowed to to just kind of overflow and not impact structures um, from a development community standpoint we've, we've really encroached on those and really kind of cut off the function of those floodplains mm -hmm. which is which is significant mm -hmm. um, the other piece is that going back to the second grade we all learned about the the, the water cycle and rainfall, other precipitation used to soak into the ground. Mm -hmm. And we substantially changed that. And by changing that in, co in combination with uh, encroaching on the floodplain, we've, we've created and exacerbated flooding situations. Mm -hmm. um, so both of those things have to, have to be addressed in some way. Low impact development can help reduce the amount of water that's flowing over land and help to get some of that water and mimicking natural systems and getting it to infiltrate. That, that's really the, the, the whole crux of, of low impact development and green infrastructure. You'll hear that term kind of synonymous yeah. in, in some cases. Uh, there are a number of examples. I think we've got some great examples at the health center that we've, we've done right. at County Extension. Uh, that we're taking water out of and keeping it out of the system. And there it serves another benefit in that it's in a uh, uh, combined sewer area. So we're also helping the city of Omaha meet that ma federal mandate to uh, not have combined sewer overflows. So it can be, it, LID is not the solution for everything, right. but, it, but it can substantially help, uh, particularly uh, at, the, at the, uh, the point where the rain falls. It's, it's, they are small elements that can be put in place that definitely help. Well, I really appreciate it, and I apologize again for <clears throat> having this so late um, because it's in a very important issue. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, if you, anybody has any questions, I certainly can ask Kent. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, I'll, leave that up through, I'll leave that to the chair. But I'm, I'm sure you okay. All, want to make all, all right. Is he limited to two minutes? Is that the deal? No, I'm just kidding. Jim, I apologize. You've been very patient. Uh, you're, good, you're a good sport. Well, let me say, we're limited to 20 minutes at this point. Yeah. And if we continue, <coughs> we're going to have to go to 903. Jim Thompson, 1001 South 35th Avenue. I'm here on behalf of the Papio, Missouri River Natural Resource District. Uh, I precipitated this uh, resolution in front of you. It was a series of meetings, and I was going to go through the meetings and all that, but I'll just cut to the chase. Um, Resolution you have in front of you is flawed. Uh, let's get talk about what the resolution says. Um, it's puzzling that Douglas County, and I get this from constituents and some other board members, why you would adopt a resolution not even in Washington County, or in Douglas County, but Washington County. Uh, as far as I know, they have not adopted for fear that this structure that you re reference is going to be built. Uh, they know it won't be built. We, the Papio, know that this big structure won't be built. Um, why would you even consider it as a 
Douglas County Board. Uh, no order to say that it'll be built in Washington County, except in 2004 when it was first discussed and it went away. Matter of fact, preparing for this, I was going to, well, where's that map again? I've got file folders, as you folks probably do at home. I couldn't find it. It went away. So I can find it, but it's not necessary. Um, furthermore, your resolution on strong opposition of dams elsewhere, which is hidden there in the language, uh, has never been, nor does it now, including with Kent's uh, 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 discussion, does include any scientific or engineering basis for that position. That's what bothers me. It bothers our board. I think it's time you recognize that building flood control structures are essential to protecting lives and property. When dams are built, we reduce flooding and enhance water quality in the most economical way. Do you have any idea how many thousands of rain gardens and thousands of undesirable rain barrels the county would need to establish to hold back a fraction of the water a dam could hold back? When dams are built, the floodplain shrinks. When the new maps that were recently created finally get approved by FEMA, millions of dollars, millions, will be saved by those property owners that no longer reside in the floodplain. It shrinks, it goes away. You're on this side of the map now. You don't have to pay, pay flood insurance. Uh, uh, folks in the business know what that means, and uh, maybe some of you already pay it. I know probably Claire Duda does. <laughs> I wish I had flooded insurance. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, when dams are built, we create recreational activities as a side benefit. Simply look at the popularity of Flanagan Lake since it opened, and, and Commissioner Morgan was on hand for the groundbreaking. Thank you very much for that participation. I think your positive comments back then were, were very welcome. Um, but why would you take that position, deny the population the opportunity to experience needed recreation, such as fishing, trail use, camping, picnicking, et cetera? When dams are built, developers build things on the property outside the floodplain. Special note, we are not in bed with developers, nor do we build these structures for their benefit, as others has accused us of doing. What happens on private land outside the structure itself um, we have no control over that. The city or county has jurisdiction over zoning and all that. We don't zone that. By the way, our practices and policy include low impact methods as a tool to minimize flooding, as Kent uh, uh, indicated. Our relationship with NRCS is strong, where we assist farmers for terracing, drainage ditch improvements, etc. We also have a program to help fund rain gardens. Uh, the county had gotten a couple of grants from us, one on 42nd to Center, which now that building is sold and the rain garden has gone to, gone to weeds. Uh, by the way, when you create a rain garden, like they see at the Med Center on Lovemorth and 42nd, you have to maintain them to be functional. When you just put them in there and ignore them, they become dysfunctional and doesn't start, uh, hold the water like they should. Um, I realize that this resolution is only a statement on paper, but it certainly misleads the direction of where your governing body should apply its energy. As we tried in the past, getting Douglas County to join the Papua Watershed Partnership where the engineering work, scientific discussions, and recommendations prevail over us politicians ranting over things we know little about. <laughs> your joining that would benefit uh, all those jurisdictional lines that are ignored by nature. Um, I want to thank Mr. Boyle for bringing the, the information on the dams. There's a distinct dis, uh, difference between a high hazard dam and low hazard dam. Those that failed uh, were low hazard, and I haven't examined each one of those. But what you've shown us is that if the dam weren't there, how much more damage would there have been for those heavy rain events? And that's part of the analysis, that little uh, handout you got. Um, <laughs> can you imagine? Yeah, the water spreads, dams hold back the water, and that's a good thing. Uh, we cannot stop urban sprawl. If any of us could do that, uh, we, the need to control floods would be less. Our actions, the actions our board has taken to build what we can and to plan for more flood control are done to protect not only us, but our children's children's children. And that benefit is worth it. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Jim. And uh, we'll we'll talk further when uh, I'll buy you lunch after what you sat through. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, same for you, uh, Ms. Leal uh, Sean. I appreciate your being here. <laughs> give us your name and address, and uh, <laughs> and give us hell. Uh, Sean Lotz, 10404 North 132nd Street, Omaha, Nebraska. I'm back. Yes, <laughs> great. Good to see you. Uh, I am praising you, the Douglas County Commissioners, for considering this resolution opposing the Papio Missouri River NRD's dam building plan. I believe this county board has been a leader in providing innovative solutions to stormwater ma management and controlling flood r risks throughout. Uh, Douglas County and Washington County through your joint stormwater policies. I was privileged to serve as one of the original members of the committee that helped develop these policies. We worked hard to present policies that offered less intrusive, less taxpayer funded methods of improving water quality and controlling water quantity uh, runoff, such as low impact development that was mentioned earlier and enhancing regulations, which the county did to minimize runoff. The final version was uh, approved in November of 2007. Your policies are a cornerstone of protecting the watershed. If our government entities followed your lead, the implied need for flood control risk could easily be accomplished by a stroke of the pen rather than using public money to spend on addition and uh, enhancing and growing property taxes that's already out of control in our state. Simple example of what this board has adopted is stop filling in and building up the floodplain. Stop floodplain infringement. Require conservation design and low impact development. And where we are today is that last week we learned through a couple of joint meetings with the Papua NRD and the Corps there were forums that the Corps of Engineers is now doing a $3 million study on flood risk. Uh, during this event, we asked the Corps to study less costly and less intrusive measures for controlling this threat and not allow a path of fear where dams are the only solution. Further, we pointed out that property taxes coupled with eminent domain and condemnation power should never be used for economic development or recreational purposes, especially under the guise of flood control. In addition, we strongly suggested that the core study includes uses of LIDs and a comprehensive review of existing regulations by the City of Omaha and Sarpy County and the other organizations that aren't following our lead through the stormwater policies. If we don't, logically every dam built will have additional development occur, oh, yeah. which causes additional runoff. The cycle will not change without a change in regulations and philosophies. The current system perpetuates itself, passing the burden to future generations <coughs> to solve and pay for a never ending problem, which just brings us back to the resolution before <laughs> this board. I respectfully request that this board continue on its path, path of being proactive and request that you adopt this resolution. By doing so, perhaps it would help guide the joint PAPU NRD Corps of Engineers study to actively consider logical alternatives to building dams. And, and with that, I would ask for a revision <laughs> to include the Douglas County dams that are within your jurisdictions mm. in that resolution. <laughs> I agree to some extent with what uh, Director Thompson said where you mentioned just Washington County dams <laughs> as a person who is affected by two of the dams in, within the county I would greatly appreciate a, an amendment a friendly amendment to the resolution where would you place that comma Washington Douglas County okay <laughs> I'll make that motion or That's and yeah. Douglas County yeah if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. I don't, thank you very much, Sean. I don't Sean. see Appreciate any it. questions. Okay. Are we looking at action today? I, I, we can, or you want to do it next week? <laughs> I, I, well, why don't we add uh, Douglas County in there, if you don't but, mind? I'm making a friendly motion. Maybe we should do it well, can next I, week. Only because they're here. Next week yeah. for town. Now. Oh, I think now. Okay, let's do it now then. I, I mean, wanna, because they're set. Well, I know that. Yeah. Eight hours. I just I agree. I'm <laughs> responding to Claire. I would like. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Boyks. Well, I just want to. 
Borgeson or Boyle? Borgeson. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I guess I, I don't want to take action today because if Director Thompson just came up and said the resolution has inaccuracies in yeah. it, then we need to fix that. Yeah. So, That's right. um, you know, and again, I guess, you know, it, it, it is our issue, but it's not our issue, so I agree with you. Um, so we, I think we need to have a little bit more uh, information on what exactly we're voting against or voting for. Okay, I, I would agree to that. I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, it was pretty rushed because this meeting was like Wednesday that they had, and I didn't know about it till Tuesday afternoon. So I don't have a problem with uh, finessing and correcting. I rely on you to help as well. But let me just say the reason that uh, this was focused on Washington County is, you know, this all started when we had that group together, and I turned to Claire and I said, how come Washington County's out of here? You know, why'd they get out? We went up there and listened to it, and there's a plan, plan to take all this farmland, valuable farmland, and turn it into lakes and so forth. And, and it is related to developers. I'm not saying it's a, uh, not a conspiracy, but it is. So I had a, I had a developer call me and tell me, he said, uh, me, a guy who gave money to me, and under the word, underlined the word gave in the past. Anyway, he said, uh, Mike, what the hell are you doing? And I said, we we're opposing LB160. Does that ring a bell? And uh, he said, I said, well, we we're trying to do this and that. And he said, well, you're destroying development in Douglas County. And he slammed the phone down. And so, I mean, you know, I, don't, I mean, whatever you want to say, there are people living around these lakes that were developed at public funds. And I told him during that conversation, you know, I live in the old market. If you want to build lakes, you pay for it. That's what I said. Well, anyway, why don't we, uh, Larry, I'm sorry, I think what we need to do is get to, get to this next week and we'll sharpen the language. And I'll, frankly, uh, Jim, I'll uh, talk to you and you see what you think about it, and Sean as well. And uh, we'll kind of get something that we can agree on a little bit, I hope, Jim. Well, can I say, uh, Larry, I'll let you speak. I want to I build on, on Commissioner Borgson's deal. And Sean, I have all the love for you sitting in on that conference before, but when this thing happened before, I felt it was a little bit of our ownership, and we made the tweaks to the to the policies and continue to. But I'm gonna just tell you, I have a hard time for as Douglas County's dipping in the Washington County stuff. <laughs> and I'm just telling you, I, I I'm all for low impact development, but I'm not a believer that all dams are bad. Mm -hmm. And this this is the read on that. And the last thing, you know, I want to do, I would be extremely mad if Cass County start passing resolutions that they don't agree with stuff in, in, in Douglas County. So that, that's where I'm at on that. Larry. Uh, very quickly, uh, I hope everybody's a little bit in touch with the controversies about chicken processing plants, chicken raising farms. As I understand it, there are some applications, if not already occurring in Washington County. And of course, we know water flows down the middle, uh, so that water would be coming this way also. These uh, disposal ponds are a topic. I've been out to Fremont and been in on some of that stuff out there, and uh, it, it's uh, kind of scary what I've heard. N uh, the barn raising problem is, n is not quite as scary as what comes after that. The corporations want to come in because it's economically beneficial to pick up the, ki the chickens there and process them there and that brings a lot of trucks in and out all the time but what do they do with the waste that problem is not solved so maybe you folks can bring that up in terms of washington county thank you thank you Commissioner we were involved in this we started out as a five county whatever and we, Claire and I went up there and found out what was going on in Washington, and we felt that that was not appropriate and we didn't approve it, so we pulled out. So that's why we have our nose in Washington County. These folks are up above us, and it's, it's a part and parcel of being opposed to eminent domain in this case. I mean, we just passed one, but I know, but this is taking valuable farmland, and I mean hundreds of acres, hundreds of acres, maybe thousands of acres, and doing this. And there's no um, indication that uh, these are really solving much of anything. The other thing is, you'll remember, I went down and testified on LB160, and uh, so we were given by Hal Dobb, a lobbyist, uh, who said, well, we'll just, we'll give you uh, control over 
any dam exclusively in your county. And of course, there was then they didn't build any exclusively in our county. So, which we figured we tried to get that removed, but it didn't work. So, we've been around the block with these folks a few times. I'd like to have a better relationship with them. Um, you know, uh, Jim and I will go to lunch, and I won't put my finger in their soup or anything. But uh, I, I do think we need to have a better one. And so, I don't mind laying this over for a week. I, I kind of thought we should anyway. And we'll spice up the language and we'll find out what you think it should be. But I think we rightfully have a nose in what happens in Washington County. They're neighbors of ours and we're part of a county government. And, and I think it's important we support uh, farmers when their land is being taken over by dams that, you know, I don't know. It seems like all we have is houses and it, more, it leads to more urban sprawl. <laughs> so anyway, I move we, uh, I don't think we have to do anything to lay this over. We'll just bring it up for next week. And I would like Mr. Holm to make a even a bigger presentation next time we have time. And let's uh, make it for that's, early that's fine. On Just let me yeah. let me say that. The last time yeah. the Washington County's board not even got the same makeup. They came to us, we sat in a room, I remember going up there in their room sitting down. And unless Washington County comes in here and says they want us to be a part, I'm I'm not gonna get in Washington County's business. Well that's kind of Disappointing. I think that's probably retaliation. No. Well, <laughs> it's not. I'm I not guess changing my position on the juvenile justice center. I have a meeting at one thirty. Mike, it's got okay. I'm just leaving. It's got nothing okay, to do with that. Okay, never mind. Um, all right. With that, we'll go to uh, G, Human Resources. Item one is as presented the weekly personnel report. There are no legislative items, and we do have a need for executive session for the purpose of labor negotiations, litigation, and real estate. With that, is there a motion to go into executive session? Uh, is there a second? second? Motion by Commissioner Duda, second by Commissioner Morgan. Please vote. Motion passes. Commissioners Boyle and Kavanaugh are absent. All our commissioners voting yes. And we're going in again for labor negotiations, litigation, and real estate.